So uh, thank you everybody by Verizon time is the top of the hour and I always like to start things on time. I appreciate you coming to uh, Crack the Hack 2022 uh, presented to you by Kyber Security. We've got some great content and experts today uh, from Kyber, from Datto, from ConnectWise, uh, some pretty compelling content along the way today. So we hope we keep you all engaged throughout the program. A couple pieces of housekeeping. Uh, number one, we are recording this webinar. Um, so just for your own edification that it is being recorded and, and could be potentially replayed at some point. Um, uh, when we ask you to participate throughout the course of the day, there will be questions asked by the panelists. There will be some polls. Um, you can submit questions and answers in the Q&A section or throw something into the chat. We'll be watching that along the way. Um, when you do participate, uh, you will be entered into drawings at the end for prizes. Uh, we've got some pretty cool swag and gift cards and other special cool things uh, that we'll be uh, drawing for afterwards and, uh, and giving out to folks uh, after, um, after the presentation uh, uh, via email. Uh, additionally, uh, for those who hang out to the end, uh, lunch is on us. So uh, you will be receiving a $25 DoorDash gift card so you can get yourself lunch, maybe not for today, but for hopefully a, a day in the, in the near future. Um, and those will be sent to the email address that you registered for the event on. So check those email addresses if you didn't use your primary one. I um, think that is all of the basic housekeeping. So uh, with the boring stuff out of the way, I'd like to introduce to you Bob Thomas uh, from Kyber Security. He is our uh, CISO, a CIO. Uh, for our organization, as well as for many of our clients. Um, Bob is an expert in uh, many things, cybersecurity and compliance, um, and uh, certainly with the NIST cybersecurity framework that he's going to be talking about uh, today. I'm your moderator, Mike Jafrida, um, and uh, you'll hear from me here or there, but uh, most of your time will be spent listening to the people who really know what they're talking about, which are the great experts we have today. And with that, I'll hand over to Bob. Thanks very much, Mike. Appreciate it. And good morning, everyone. Uh, what we want to talk about, uh, we want to get some background on uh, something called the NIST cybersecurity framework. Uh, it is not, we, we probably preface every statement that we talk to folks about this, it is not a compliancy. Uh, it is intended to be a framework specifically to guide you and your business through protecting your organization, your assets, your data. Uh, and it's made up of these five pillars that you see on the screen, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. They are used in that specific order um, because obviously if you don't have a beginning point identifying uh, exactly what you have, uh, you really can't find your path to protecting that information. Um, I know this is a very busy slide, but it um, it does paint a certain picture of how the small to mid-sized business has really um, grown in complexity. It's not your uh, it's not your grandfather's Oldsmobile anymore, so to speak, where you have uh, paper, pencil, telephone, and maybe a computer running the business. You know, it's a very uh, elaborate component list that we put together in most instances that are running your business. You know, you can see the bullet list here and that's probably uh, not even scratching the surface of what it is. Yeah, everybody has email. There's now mobile devices uh, at the ready, you know, whether those be smartphones or tablets, uh, laptops have now become almost the corporate standard uh, with work from home uh, evolving over the last few years. Uh, people come to us every day and say, hey, what should we have uh, for standards? Now, we're now recommending more often than not laptops as opposed to desktops just for mobility and, uh, and that ability to work from home. Websites, social media, e-commerce. Um, you know, e-commerce doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you've got a huge presence on, this, on the web uh, that where you're selling items all over the place. You could have a retail outlet. We have uh, some clients that are in that space. Um, but this really shows how many pieces make up um, your standard small to mid-sized business. And obviously with each piece um, being added to the puzzle, it gets more complex and there's more facets to protect. Um, you know, online banking, you know, 
how does everybody hear about all of these uh, attacks that are out there where, oh my God, uh, the money got sent to the wrong location. That's all a function of online banking. It's, um, we all agree, probably can't live without it, trying to move money quickly from customers to vendors. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a very big gaping hole that you have to be able to protect and you have to know who you're communicating with. Bring your own device has become a huge thing. Um, I, I think uh, it may not be the plan of attack normally. It's evolved that way because all of a sudden people needed to work and work from anywhere. Well, I have a device from home I can use. Well, we can't get equipment fast enough. I think that's a great alternative. Use your machine from now until we can get you a corporate owned machine. And then of course, you know, trying to monitor and manage a network of all these pieces and, and backup and remote access, you know, last line of defense, if you can't, um, if you can't deal with uh, cleaning an environment uh, that's been affected by, let's say ransomware, got to go to backup. And, um, and a lot of the reasons that issues occur are remote access that's not implemented properly and, and protected and, and securely. Um, I think some of the things that are out there in the world that need to be uh, spelled out are the most common threats to those items that we just showed on the last page. Phishing attacks are, you know, every day people are getting emails and trying to be tricked into essentially either opening an attachment or clicking on a link that's embedded in an email. And, you know, one of the really impressive things, I know it's not a great story to tell, but these, these phishing attacks with the content of the emails that have been created by these scam artists are really very sophisticated and they are very believable. They are no longer awful content, misspellings, um, use of the English language improperly. Those attacks are uh, broadcast you know, so they are going to thousands, tens of thousands, even millions with one little piece of code that they've created. And maybe they've copied um, logos and information specifically from, let's say, banking sites. You know, you see an email coming, come in and you're a Chase customer or a, you know, you're maybe new uh, to M&T Bank because they just bought out Peoples in our region. Okay, well, that's a perfect example of you're waiting for an email, but maybe it's not a legitimate email. Ransomware, huge thing, um, you know, encrypting your data, locking it, um, and basically requiring money in order to unlock it and maybe unlock it in air quotes, mostly because you don't know if you're going to get the key to unlock it. And if they do get the data, what are they going to do with the data? Are they going to broadcast it for sale? on the dark web. Um, data mining, you know, the, they get access into your systems. They can extract information and exfiltrate it. And, you know, maybe it's to sell, maybe it's to use against you. Um, and it, it usually starts with some sort of imposter scam to be able to get into your network. Uh, they've got maybe a way in where they've clicked, uh, forced you to click or, you know, tricked you into clicking something. And it doesn't look like anything has happened, but they sit there dormant. You know, the, the statistics are as much as half a year sitting dormant in your systems waiting for something to happen. And then the business email compromise with the folks from ConnectWise are going to show us exactly how those things occur, how we're able to monitor and how we're able to uh, stop them in their tracks. But business email compromise is probably the most popular thing that's going on right now. Somebody invading uh, either Google or Microsoft 365. They found credentials out on the dark web. They've used those protections weren't properly set up. And before you know it, they're in your me email and they're reading it and um, ready to take action. Um, so just as a, uh, a starting point, we've got a quick poll here um, that we're gonna run uh, and we wanna know what people think about uh, what are the largest issues, threats to your organization, whether it be the, you know, we just went through them, phishing attacks, ransomware, is it data mining people trying to get, har harvesting your data and getting access to it, which could even be, 
you know, they intercept a laptop, a uh, stolen laptop at airports happens every day and they get access to the information on it because the information wasn't encrypted. I think those are uh, common ways of people getting at large sums of data, imposter scams, where they're trying to trick you into uh, thinking there's someone else. And that could be even over the phone uh, to try to get you to quote unquote, reset your password and the business email compromise that we just talked about. I think if you just uh, choose one of those polls, we can get an idea of what, uh, what folks are feeling out there and seeing and hearing. Give just another few seconds for everybody to choose. Okay. Moving on. The stats say that uh, phishing attacks are far and away the highest uh, concern that folks feel out in the world today. Almost 60% of the participants uh, feel that way, uh, followed by ransomware and business email compromise. So um, we're trying to understand exactly you know, what's, why, why are small businesses being attacked? What, what is it that they have that would be of value to somebody that's trying to create a cyber attack? And I think the real important thing to understand specifically around why small businesses are a focus is specifically that they have uh, typically less protections in place. And what I mean by that is Fortune 1000 companies have tons of resources, have almost limitless resources. And that doesn't mean just money, that means talent and, and personnel to be able to implement those. The small business has typically been left behind to kind of fend for themselves. And that's why managed security services providers exist. That's why new tools are developed every single day to try to make that environment, that small to mid-sized business, a more robust and uh, secure entity that's not as easy to infiltrate. It's not as easy to be attacked. And I think everybody believes that since the protections are not in place, that they'll be easy um, to get into and when they're easy to get into, they can take advantage of them because there aren't these uh, important protections in place. Let's just run through a few real quickly here. Um, they see them as vulnerable. It, it's easy to see them uh, in this vein because of the things that I just talked about where they, they don't have necessarily the money and the resources and the time to expend to be able to protect their environments. So they see them as, as a, a ripe target. Business costs, they, how are they going to get back up and running once something happens? You know, if you need to be able to react and react quickly when an attack hits and your data is either compromised or is potentially going to be compromised, how do you uh, stop the attack? How do you quarantine the machines? How do you get your business back up and running at full strength? Those are really important things to understand. Um, and they're second by second things that have to be done. You have to have a plan. If you don't have a written plan to be able to do this, you're behind the eight ball and it will be much more difficult running around with your hair on fire trying to figure out what do I do? Who do I call? How do I react? And then I think people maybe don't think about this until afterwards, but reputation. How are you going to recover from an incident that potentially hits the news? You can't ship product. You can't service your clients. What happens to your name and your branding when those types of situations arise? Who do you call to assist you with brand reputation improvement? and recovery. Have you spoken to your insurance carrier? Have they been able to help you? Do you have cyber coverage? 
There's a lot of different things that go into this, but these are the reasons um, that it's difficult if protections are not in place to try to recover in an orderly fashion. Um, I think one of the things that we wanna really understand today is exactly how does the NIST framework help us in being able to protect our organizations and why is it structured this way in these five pillars that I talked about before? You know, and as I mentioned, it, it's this is voluntary. This is not a compliance. There isn't somebody, the government's not holding a gun to your head to say, you need to do this. This was developed by the government as a way uh, to level the playing field and give people real guidelines, real suggestions for how to protect their organizations. Um, it, it's really um, about putting together the best security posture in order to respond to exactly the threats that exist in our world today and as they evolve every day. Um, as it says, it, this is not an industry standard. This is not Department of Defense. This is not medical. This is not financial. It, it applies to all organizations and in all industries. It doesn't matter size. This is small, medium size, and large organizations still use this as a guideline to build their security practice and protect their organization. Um, it's, it's intended to be comprehensive. It is built for um, putting together a real program that has multiple layers to be able to protect and defend against cyber attacks. So this isn't antivirus and, oh yeah, I kept my machine up to date. At scratching the surface of exactly how this works today. And we'll go through some examples as we move forward. Um, and it also is a, um, I think we use it as a common language to talk to clients and prospects every day to try to help them um, understand exactly what makes up a program like this in the framework. It's, uh, it is a common language for all of us to use. Excuse so, me, Bob, before you move forward, uh, we yeah. do have uh, one participant, Alex, who has raised his hand. Alex, if you have a question, I'm not sure if you can unmute, but if you can, you can ask your question. Otherwise, you can submit it into the Q&A. Great. Brandon, can you unmute Alex? Yes, I have. Go ahead, Alex. Yes. Alex, do you have a question? All right, let's 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 move forward, Alex. If you come up with that question, you can uh, you can go ahead and spit it in the chat. Brandon, you can put his hand down. Thanks, Mike. Um, so these are um, the five pillars that make up the framework. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Um, we're going to go through each one. I, I don't want to take a lot of time, you know, spelling them out here. Uh, you'll see exactly how they play into um, a real cybersecurity program and exactly what's contained in each one of these. It'll make sense here as we go through. Um, so identify. Should be obvious, but you can't protect what you don't know that you have. So this is, and a lot of people will think about identifying, well, I just got to figure out, you know, what, whatever computers I have. That's I guess that's the starting point, but it is not everything. It is quote unquote asset systems, data capabilities. You really have to think about all of the pieces that make your organization run. Yeah, probably computers, servers, whether they're at your facilities or they're hosted in the cloud. Well, what gives you access? Well, you know, if I don't have internet, I can't get to anything if, if I've got cloud hosted applications. Okay. That's a consideration. I have data. Well, where is my data? If you don't know where all of it's located, how do you protect it? So it's a very, it sounds like a very simple task, but it is incredibly important to really spell it out, put it on paper and make sure that you've got everything accounted for. Now, the last item on here, capabilities, how do you do what you do for your business? You know, who in your organization is responsible for each department and do they understand when they can't do something, what the overall impact is? I think those are really, really critical things to understand. And this is a kind of an action uh, list and we, we put these together 
for each one of the pillars of the uh, NIST cybersecurity framework program. So yeah, it's not just identifying hardware, it's identifying critical business process. How do I do what I do? Where, you know, what is the workflow that takes place? Do I have that documented? And I think this is a huge thing. We get asked this every single week and we ask clients about this every single week. Do you have information flow data moving around your organization and do you have it documented? How do you get it? How does it get into your organization? This is a big question with Department of Defense because it needs to be protected inbound and outbound. It's a huge thing. Um, do you have policies? You know, have to not only have a written policy, but how do you assign that policy? Who's responsible? Who, who has to take action? Um, maintenance of hardware and software inventory. Okay, you have this list, but it's a point in time. Do you have an automated way to be able to keep that up to date? Um, you know, we use a tool from ConnectWise and that's how we manage our environment and all our clients' environments. It's a tool that we can pull data immediately at any time without having to manually key in information. Um, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a great way of being able to understand what you have that needs protecting. Uh, contracts, this is a huge thing. Um, you know, who do you have contracts with? More importantly, who do you not have contracts with that are vendors or clients that you're relying upon and are relying upon you? And you should identify, you know, a specific risk management process. What's at risk? How do I protect it? Do I have cyber insurance as part of that protection mechanism? Does my, um, does my policy have a limit? So if I exceed that limit, I'm on the hook for the rest. Is there a deductible uh, before the limit that I'm responsible for in recovering? And they'll only pay after that. Those are very important issues to, to think about in the process of identifying what's, what needs to be protected in your world. Uh, and uh, Brandon's gonna key up another poll here, a scale of one to five, how easily could you identify the areas of your organization that need to be protected? I'll leave that up there for a minute or so, uh, just to get people's input. You know, oh, it's a one through five. There's, you know, the, once you start thinking about all those pieces, it's, you know, it's work to try to understand um, exactly what there is to protect and do you already have it documented or is that a project? And just a reminder for every participation in one of these polls or a question from a panelist, uh, gets you another entry into uh, the, the prizes that we'll be selecting uh, after, the, uh, after the program is over. An important note, very true, Mike. Okay. So, uh, kind of a smattering of folks, um, uh, probably the lion's share are under four. We've got uh, about, I'd say, 80% that are under four, one, two, and three, kind of uh, spread almost equally. And then uh, people feel four and five are, uh, are less. Okay, let's move on. Uh, protect, probably pretty obvious. Um, you need to be able to protect those items that we just discussed in the last slide. How do we do that? How do we put real protection, security safeguards in place? And you know, similar to the last slide deck where we did something with identify, here are your protection action items. You know, you be, not only have you been able to find your assets, now you need to manage them. How do we protect those assets? All the data needs to be backed up, it needs to be backed up regularly. How do you how do you make sure that that data wandering around on laptops or even on servers in your environment is truly protected? The best way to do that is not only back it up, but also encrypt it. You ought to have an automated way of patching operating systems and applications. You know, we use a tool from ConnectWise to do that. 
obviously backups. We use a, a tool from, from Datto to do that. It's, it's uh, putting all the pieces in place to be able to make recovery quicker, easier. You know, one of the things that I hear Mike say all the time, if you're going to do one thing, you have to do multi-factor authentication. You've got to put two-factor in, in order to be able to log into anything. Met with a client the other day. We said, we already did the research. We know these two, two hosted tools that you guys are using offer multi-factor. We can't put it on for you unless you give us the access. You're like, oh, well, we think it's going to be a pain. Well, it may be a pain for a week. People get used to it. People need to have that extra protection in place. It needs to be enabled if the, if the vendor is allowing for it and making it available. Um, I know it's, we sound like a broken drum here, but create response and recovery plans. This isn't just backup and disaster recovery. This is incident response. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And you've got to train and test your employees. This is not process and procedural training. This is security training. Make sure that they can understand what a, a phishing email looks like, what they should be looking for. What are the tactics that there are in use today? I think those are important things for them to know so that they're on the lookout for them, so that they can protect your organization as, a, as another knife in the drawer. Um, you know, when we talk about hostile email, this is just such a big thing right now. I'm not gonna go deep into the weeds because obviously the guys at ConnectWise are gonna show us business email compromise and exactly how it works, but things you have, you've gotta be careful about unsubscribing. I mean, it sounds like, oh, well, I'm just unsubscribing. Well, just, it, that link could have been compromised. Anytime you're clicking a link, if you don't have some sort of email security program in place that's watching for you, that link could be a fake link and take you either to a place that's a website that's been compromised or it could put code on your machine that they could use to um, take, over, take control of your machine, watch you as you're typing, so the key loggers, any of these things, opening attachments, you gotta be super careful about that and the content, are you expecting that to, to exist? Um, and here's a, this is an amazing example. Um, this, we, we took real content and put it into uh, uh, this screenshot. And if you'll notice the link, yes, it was sent to somebody from our organization. Uh, so it, you know, it looks like it came out of our alerting system, alerts at kybersecure.com. Yeah, well, that's fake. First, first of all, that's not a legitimate email, but not everybody would know that. But even more importantly, it's been spoofed so that somebody made it look like it was coming from that organization, but that's not true. And if you look at the link, they're asking you to click, it's kybersecurity-security.com. Well, that's not our organization. So these are the things when you see an email like this, you've got to pay attention to exactly what's being asked. Please complete the check by end of business on Friday. These kind of call to action, quick action are really a concern and things you have to be looking out for. Um, we've got a poll on a scale of one to five. How likely is it that you would be able to detect any nefarious behavior that's going on in your network um, you know, with uh, some sort of protection tool or detection tool that might be in place? Um, do you have those types of things, advanced threat detection, monitoring of logs, looking at activity that's going on uh, real time? You know, It may not be you looking, it could be a security operations center, but somebody that's watching 24 seven, 365, for things that are an anomaly in your environment. And you know, you look at three different things happening at the same time. Why are those three happening? That that should never happen. It's that kind of correlation that the SOC looks for and 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 can make an immediate decision saying that that machine needs to be quarantined. And if it goes further, this machine also needs to be quarantined, dropped off the network to be able to protect your world. So if you choose one of those, that's great. So 
Detect is the uh, third pillar uh, of the NIST cybersecurity framework. Um, obviously, uh, you, we've identified stuff, we've tried to protect stuff. Well, if we can't detect something that's gone wrong in an organization, how can we really respond? So as with the others, we've got some action items. You have to have up-to-date antivirus. And, and when we say up-to-date, this isn't meaning that it's the latest version, but it's also got to be a quality product that can understand real malware and real issues that are being developed today to kind of counteract the legacy antivirus that uses just a, a file of known viruses. By the time somebody updates that file, it's too late. Um, you have to understand where your data is going in order to detect something that's gone wrong. And what I mean by that is, you know, something can, you could normally interact with the server, but all of a sudden your machine is interacting with other machines, other computers, laptops, desktops in your environment, what we call lateral movement. Well, that's not normal, or maybe it's not normal in your world. Well, if you can't, figure out that that's happening, if there's no detection mechanism to be able to find that, well, that's a problem. Um, and it needs to be acted on very quickly because that's usually nefarious behavior. Part of that is by collecting logs and being able to look at those logs and look at them over time. Most logs in, in, in hardware, software, uh, inside firewalls, switches, Wi-Fi units, it only stores the information for maybe a day or so. Well, if you're not offloading those logs someplace else for long-term storage, by the time you find out that there's a problem, you've got no log to look back at to figure out what happened and how it happened. And advanced threat detection software, it's really, it's the only way to really truly monitor and protect the endpoints in your environment. You're not gonna be able to catch activity that shouldn't be happening. And once we've got detection and, and data from that detection mechanism, we need to be able to respond. And, and by responding, we need to be able to do these things. We, we need to understand who's going to react, both internally and externally. Who needs to know about what's happened in the environment? Who, who's going to be impacted and adversely? And they have to be notified. Uh, you've got to have these plans in place. And, you know, we talk about plans, both disaster recovery and incident response. Not only do you have to have a plan in writing, you've got to test it. And I, I assure you from testing it, it will need updating. This is, it's automatic every time. I don't care how sophisticated you are. You will shoot a hole in it. And that hole needs to be plugged with an update and say, oh, we found this during the test of our plan. And we could have done better if we had had this in place. Um, if you, you'll never have all the resources you need internally. It's not realistic. You need to have experts at the ready so that you can call them, bring them in to help you. You know, this may be a combination of your managed security provider and your insurance company, but those folks need to be involved. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think I think people are a little hesitant to pick up the phone and call their insurance agent or their carrier as the first line of defense. They ought to be one of the first phone calls. If you're paying for cyber liability insurance, there are resources that they will make available to you to make sure that you can recover in a timely way and to make sure that you can have a thriving uh, business that's not being interrupted. And part of this is having, as I said, an incident response plan. Um, let us know, do you have a written and tested incident response plan? And I have to draw the distinction between disaster recovery plan and incident response. I believe most of the world thinks they're the same thing. They're really not. Disaster recovery, yeah, okay, my server failed. The, the motherboard died in it. How do I get back up and running? Is the machine under warranty? Do I, you know, how do I react to that? Uh, do I go to backup? Um, can my backup appliance run instead of my server? And then how do I get fully back up and running with new equipment? Yeah, that's a disaster. 
that's not a necessarily an incident or the only type of incident. Incidents typically involve breaches, potential data loss, potential exfiltration of data. It's those types of things that are really important um, to understand, understand the impact, and then understand exactly how you're going to react. About 63% uh, said they have a, a plan in place and it's tested. That's the best news I've heard today, to tell you the truth. It is, a, it is a mandatory thing to have in place to make sure that you can get back up and running quickly. 16% are not sure and 21% are sure that they don't have something and um, I guess they realize the importance of that. Uh, and the last step in the, in the process is recover. Uh, probably pretty obvious that, you know, once something happens, you've got to get to the point of recovery. Um, having a really resilient system, whether that's on-site or cloud-based is important, but issues happen every day, um, regardless of where uh, your data and your systems are housed. Uh, so I think it, it, it behooves you to make sure that you've got a way to manage your public relations, your reputation. Again, your insurance company may be uh, a good point of reaction to be able to help. They, they have a lot of resources at the ready. Um, you've got to communicate both internally and externally to anybody that's involved and that is a stakeholder. And this ought to happen immediately. You ought to have somebody that's in charge of communication, one person that's make, doing the communication so that they're telling one story that there aren't mixed signals getting to people. <clears throat> you have to have updated recovery plans. Just, you have to, it may be an arduous task, having the plan built and then making sure that it's tested and updated. And then obviously cyber insurance is a huge thing as a stopgap measure. You've got to have something in place that's your backstop. So, uh, We've gone through the five pillars of the NIST cybersecurity framework. How many do you think you'd say um, you've got completely covered within your business today? One through five. Uh, well, we were waiting for that poll results to come in. A question did come in in the <laughs> Q&A. Um, how do you explain or demonstrate to upper management uh, when they ask, how do we stop phishing and ransomware? I tried to explain it can't be stopped. The hackers are always a step ahead. I'll see that answer and Bob, you can expound upon it. Um, while there is no 100% um, ability to stop uh, a ransomware attack, uh, a defense in depth strategy where you're using these multiple layers of detection methodologies, um, isolation methodologies, et cetera, um, certainly will help to uh, slow down the number of attempts that happen. Um, additionally, uh, education for your team, as we've talked about, and as we're doing here today, will certainly help people be vigilant so that they can uh, not click as many things that might become uh, damaging to the environment. Um, and having the ability to uh, isolate an attack when it does happen, which limits the amount of damage that it creates, as well as being able to quickly recover from that damage is really key since there is no 100%. And Bob, you can expand upon that if you wish um, sure. after you do your poll results or while you do Yeah, so, so the poll results say that uh, a little over half of the folks have one of the five pillars in place. Um, it makes up probably about oh, 95% uh, have up to three covered. We have 54% one, 17% two, 25% three. Only 4% have four of them covered and nobody has all five covered that are on the call today. And thank you very much for participating in the poll. Uh, it's important for us to be able to make sure that we're telling the right story and uh, the information's getting across. Um, Mike, I, I think the one thing that, um, that we see a lot are misconfigured email servers. Um, when we take over a client, and it's one of the first things that we do is we put a email security uh, tool in place. And part of doing that is we look at what their current configuration is for how mail gets transported in and out of their system. And I would say that 95% of the time they are either misconfigured or not completely 
configured for a secure environment. And that to me um, is a cause for letting in more nefarious email than is really necessary. Um, you probably don't see it until you go to implement a tool like that. And then the tool has additional capabilities. You know, it, it has a link protection mechanism so that it, it's not actually gonna send through the link, regardless if it thinks it's good or not to you, it will only validate the link once you click it. And once you click it, it will check it in a sandbox in the cloud to make sure it is truly a valid link. It's going to a known good site if it is taking you to a site and it's not going to put code onto your machine. I think those couple of things put together, uh, if we're specifically talking about phishing and spam and, and how to protect against them are, okay, they may not be super easy things to do, but they are, they're not crazy, they're not expensive, they're they're, they're tools that we use every single day that are just, we consider them to be mandatory. They're part of the package and they just get implemented and they have to be there. Um, and we've had people push back on them and we're like, we're putting it in, period. This is the only way to truly protect you and your, and your staff. So I think that's a really important piece. So Mike, I think it goes back to you. It does. Thank you. We'll talk about some lessons learned later from all of these. Uh, thank you so much, Bob, for that great information on uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework and how to set yourself up for success from a cyber standpoint. Um, from there, we are going to uh, move forward. We just did get one more question, so I will ask that because I'm guessing it was to Bob. Uh, uh, so the question is, to what extent are cyber insurance pricing schedules locked into complying with the NIST framework guidelines? Okay. That's a great question. <laughs> so um, I would say over time, um, and this is going to go far beyond pricing. It will, it has become the standard that if you do not have certain protections that are part of the NIST cybersecurity framework in place, you will not get coverage. They will, they will ref refuse to write a policy that will cover you, you have to, this is the term they use, you have to go naked for a certain amount of time until you can prove, and prove is now the right term, that you've got certain protections in place. And I'll, I'll use a, the, the, probably the easiest one. If you don't have multi-factor authentication enabled for every single account at Microsoft 365, not coverable, period. They, they, they consider you too large of a risk at that point. To answer the, the specifics of that question, if you have all of the protections or the lion's share of the protections in place, and if, if you're dealing with a legitimate real cyber coverage carrier that's offering a quote unquote um, standalone policy, and that is the term to know, uh, it is not a rider or a tack on or an add on to your business insurance policy, they will give you a questionnaire and they will follow it up with, okay, we're going to install our tool to make sure that you've told us the truth about what protections you have in place. And if you do have them in place, there are substantial discounts and probably just as important, there are increases in the limits that they will allow you to subscribe to. And what I mean by that is if a vendor comes to you and says, um, we need, you know, you need certain product and they're going to sell it to you. And then one of your clients comes to you and says, hey, we want to, we want to use you for this um, sourcing of this new product, whatever it happens to be. But in order to be comfortable that you're going to be able to deliver, we want to know that you've got a cyber liability insurance policy in place with a $3 million limit. Well, if you don't have, let's say 90% of the protections in place, there's no way you're going to get a $3 million limit. 
Maybe they'll write a million, maybe they'll write 500,000, and then you will have to pick up for 500 after that, or 150 after that, and then they'll pick up again. Maybe the deductible would be sizable. Those are the factors that the insurance carriers um, that, that they're looking at in order to make decisions right now as they're writing either new policies, and this even comes up on renewals. I just did one yesterday for a client, sent me over the policy. He said, here, I filled it out. I said, great. Answers one, two, and three that you filled out are wrong. I'm sorry to tell you that, but those are the protections are not in place. We've talked about them, but until you put this program in place, those items are not gonna be covered. And now he has to go back and he's gotta fight with his agent and his carrier to make sure that he can get the policy he needs or engage with more security. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Um, so uh, after understanding a little bit about how you could set yourself up for success, um, we uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about what happens uh, behind the scenes, things you don't see when some of these things are happening, some of these phishing attacks or these malware attacks. And I'm going to hand over to Dustin Perry from ConnectWise. Dustin is going to uh, show you a live a demo of how this happens, uh, how, we, how it can be detected, remediated, and stopped um, and for things that you'd probably never see happen as long as you were using a uh, security operations center who was monitoring for nefarious behavior. And with that, I give you Dustin Perry from ConnectWise. Awesome, thanks, Michael. All right, I'll go and get my screen shared out. Um, and, and before we hop into the demo, uh, I've got just a, a quick presentation that talks a little bit more about uh, what EDR is and how we can kind of combine it with SIM. You know, we've talked a lot today about security and layers, and that's really the best way to do it. You know, nothing in security is that that magic bullet. Um, it, it, we need to have that security and layers. And before I kind of move forward, I just want to make sure it looks like, is everybody sharing or seeing my screen? Yes. Awesome. So we'll go ahead and, and talk about ER and SIM, and then we'll get into that live demo. So first off, what is EDR? I'm sure most of you guys have at least kind of heard the term now. I know in security, we love our, our acronyms and there's always new ones, but EDR stands for Endpoint Detection and Response. And so it, it works by actually monitoring all of the activity on our endpoints. And, and that's, you know, our laptops, our servers, our desktops. We're really trying to kind of learn what's normal on the endpoint. So then we can detect things that are, are not normal. You know, they fall out of that normal category. This is typically done through machine learning. Um, we do kind of line up a lot of our detections based on the MITRE attack framework where they kind of classify, you know, what is malware doing now? You know, how is it using PowerShell, for example, you know, one of our own tools to be malicious? Why do we need it? Number one is that behavioral-based monitoring. Traditional AV just, it doesn't cut it anymore. Um, I think the last number I heard, and this is probably a 10-year-old stat, was about 500,000 new types of malware every single day. So with a, a traditional AV system where you are, you know, having to manually update your, your signature database and then manually scan, it's just not very feasible anymore. And especially now as attackers are moving to kind of living off the land, you know, using our own tools against us, traditional AV doesn't see that, you know, it sees PowerShell as PowerShell and it lets it run. You know, we, we need that to do a lot of our jobs in IT. Um, and that's where we, we need to kind of transition to that EDR type system. Gives us that real-time response and remediation. So we know in security, nothing is 100%. And when we see specific activities that are suspicious or even escalate into that malicious activity, these EDR technologies allow us to have that real-time response and remediation. And we can do it remotely. So it doesn't matter, you know, when these alerts are coming in especially when you back you know the EDR technology with a SOC, now you've got security experts looking at your information 24 7 365 you know most of the the attacks that we see typically happen especially all the big ones you know nights weekends holidays you know the times when they know 
our IT staff is going to be, you know, on that skeleton crew working a little bit less. And that's why we need to kind of pair these with the security experts as well. Because there is a lot more data collection with EDR. You know, we're not just looking at kind of the things that are executing, we're looking at everything on the endpoints. But then we also have the ability to integrate with other security solutions, including things like a SIM, you know, kind of getting all these, these layers into one piece. So why isn't traditional AV good enough anymore? Um, we kind of talked about it, but it, it really kind of comes down to, you know, just the way it works. Traditional AV can only detect previously known threats. So by that definition, you know, we're kind of always working a, a step behind of the attackers and we're trying to get ahead of them. Minimal to no data collection in that traditional AV. Uh, so it's very hard to see some of these advanced attacks. You know, they were good at, at blocking the known bad. That's kind of what it was used for. And it, it did that very well. The times are changing and we need to be a little bit more proactive. And also typically with your traditional AV, there, there's not a lot of other features. You know, it kind of just does the, the traditional AV. It's going to run a scan. It's going to block things as needed and we're good to go. EDR, um, as we mentioned, it can detect previously known and unknown threats due to that behavioral based monitoring. You know, when we see Chrome launch Microsoft Word, okay, that, that's not malicious yet. You know, that's pretty normal activity. Users downloaded a file, nothing too crazy. But when Word then launches um, a, a command prompt or PowerShell, and PowerShell is reaching out to an external IP, that's where we can say, okay, that's, that's not looking normal anymore. And we're going to use all that data that we're getting from the EDR solution to really make that determination as to, is this normal or is this actually malicious? And there's a lot of other features in most EDR solutions, including things like uh, machine isolation. So in the event, you know, something gets by, we do see some ransomware or anything like that. We actually have the ability to isolate the machines on the network. And when we do that, that, it keeps the malware from spreading. You know, if there was an attacker actually connected to the machine, it's going to kill that connection. So nobody can 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 continue uh, attacking that machine. It's not going to be able to spread across your network. And, and we'll actually demo that today with our, our demonstration. It also gives us the ability to do some advanced threat hunting and reporting as well, just because of all of that extra data. So moving in onto um, the SIM, you know, security works best in layers and EDR is really good at protecting your endpoints. But I think we all know there's a lot more when it comes to your organization. You know, Bob kind of talked about that. You've got email, you know, you've got network devices, routers, switches, firewalls. And that's where it really helps to kind of have all of that information coming into one centralized place. And that's a security information and event management or a SIM. So with most sims, you know, they want to take data from as many sources as possible, bring them all into one location. So it makes it easier to investigate these threats. Um, we can identify threats by using a set of predetermined rules. And a lot of sims are kind of evolving into some more of that behavioral analysis as well, just like EDR. Why do you need it? A lot of times now, auditing and compliance. You know, there are a lot of compliance requirements that require some sort of SIM. And you don't only need just the technology, but you actually need someone looking at these logs. It also gives us that full visibility of everything happening within the network. You know, when we see a EDR threat, now we can use the SIM to kind of give us that full picture. You know, what else has happened around the same time as this incident with our, our firewalls? You know, were there any weird RDP connections? We're kind of bringing all this into one place. So we've got all the puzzle pieces, we can answer all the questions. It also dramatically decreases the time to identify threats because everything is in one place. You know, we're no longer having to manually log into our firewalls and pull those logs, log into our other um, network devices, pull those logs, our servers. Everything's in one place, so it makes it very easy. And it gives us the ability to do that detailed forensic analysis in the event of a major security breach, which will only make security better. So I've, I've got um, kind of this real basic diagram of a, a SIM solution. This is the one we use as formerly called Perch, now uh, the ConnectWise SIM. And like any good SIM, you know, we want to take in data from as many sources as possible. So if we start off over here on the right, 
it's going to include all of your your on-prem devices you know all of those workstations those servers your network devices routers switches firewalls and then we've got what we call sim sensors and the sensors themselves are, are actual devices that we can get on your network and they actually analyze that network traffic so we're able to kind of look in the traffic and see if we see anything malicious within the traffic itself up top we've got what we call the, the work from home employees and you know we're seeing that a lot more nowadays as things are are kind of changing a little bit you know we've got the more of the hybrid work environments people working full-time remote we want to be able to protect those guys as well and you know they're not on a a traditional protected network you know a lot of times they they don't have a firewall you know they're working from a coffee shop or their house so we still want the ability to monitor and protect those and we can do that with the what we call the the log shipper it works on all of your your major endpoints and it's going to be able to gather those logs no matter where they are so as long as they've got that network connection they're going to be sending us logs down below are the cloud integrations and these are the things um, that, that we're kind of switching to, you know, Office 365. A, a lot of organizations no longer have on-prem or they're kind of moving away from that. So we still want to be able to take in the data from that, and we can do that with a direct cloud integration. One of the most important pieces, though, is up on the top left here, and, and that's the SOC or the Security Operations Center. So these are the certified threat analysts that are going to do kind of all the normal care and feeding of the SIM itself. We're going to look through all of those individual logs and find those malicious things. And when we do, that's where we work with the Kyber team to make sure that we're getting these things remediated. Speaking of the SOC, um, so obviously, as you can kind of see with these new technologies, both EDR and SIM, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of information coming in that you kind of need someone to look at. You know, we have to determine, okay, what's actually malicious? How do we respond to these things? And that's where the SOC comes in. So we're going to give you that full 24-7, 365 threat monitoring and response. We had mentioned before, you know, most cyber criminals don't work normal hours. Um, and a lot of the big breaches and, and attacks we've seen over the last few years have been on holidays. You know, times when I know I like to be at home, hopefully not having a, a cell phone attached to my hip, you know, relaxing a little bit. And that's where the SOC comes in. They're going to give you that full support. And it is fully staffed with a team of security experts. Um, I think the last number I heard was actually a, about 170 analysts in our SOC now, which is huge. You know, and we've got everybody from, you know, kind of the the tier one analysts, maybe they, they don't have as much experience in security, but they've got, you know, some of the entry level certifications, you know, security plus all the way up to some of our analysts actually have uh, more of the offensive or hacking certifications like the, the CEH, the certified ethical hacker or the, the OSCP, where it, this one's actually a really cool one in order to get that certification, they have to take a 48 hour test. First 24 hours in that test, they're hacking into five machines. Second 24 hours, they're writing their report. What can we do better to make this uh, you know, harder for the attackers? So it's a very, very difficult certification. And we've got several people in the SOC with that. We also have um, what we call our, our crew, and that's the CRU or Cyber Research Unit. They are a subsection of the SOC. And a lot of these guys are the ones with those more offensive um, certifications where they're looking into, you know, all of the new breaches going on, any new malware that they're seeing. And they're actually writing out new rules to help look for these things across all the environments that we monitor. So we're not only responding to threats, we're making the technology better. All right, so let's go ahead and hop into our, our live malware um, and business email compromise demo, kind of walk you through a, a typical attack we've probably all seen before, um, and then how we can use these tools to respond to them. Got some vacation that I had saved up, and I decided I want to go ahead and plan a trip to Europe. So while I'm kind of thinking around planning, you know, where I'm going to go, what I need to do, I realized I need to exchange some of my money 
uh, from US dollars to euros. So while I'm looking at kind of the, the current exchange rates and the best ways to do this, I find this website and they are hosting a, a Excel spreadsheet essentially that'll do a lot of conversions for me and make it really easy. So I go ahead and I, I sign up to download the spreadsheet. And a few minutes later, I receive an email. Um, and the email shows that, that someone shared a file with me. This is the euros to US dollar spreadsheet. So I go ahead and I, I click the email. It redirects me to a login page. So as I um, see, you know, it's just my, my normal Outlook login. So I go ahead and log in so I get access to this file. When I do that, uh, it doesn't really log me in, which it's a little weird, but okay. But it, it does download the file. So it downloads this euros to US dollar spreadsheet file. All right, so I've got the file now. So let's go ahead and get this open. And we're going to open the spreadsheet, you know, just like we would any other downloaded file. And I, I go to hit update currency. And, you know, nothing happens. It's not doing what it's supposed to. But it looks like macros are blocked. You know, what, what is a user always going to do? We're going to go ahead and click allow update. And looks like it, it goes out and it grabs that current exchange rate. So I'm getting the current exchange rate. Everything looks pretty normal. You know, unfortunately, in the real world, uh, some of these, these bad macros and these macro-based attacks aren't labeled start attack. Um, but before we, we go ahead and click start attack, we're going to do a little bit of pre-work on the machine. So let's take a look at our scheduled tasks. And we're going to refresh this real quick. And you can see, you know, just our, our normal scheduled tasks here. We've got Google, Edge, OneDrive, and our Sentinel-1 updater. Because our machine is protected with Sentinel-1. So let me open up a command prompt here, and we're just going to make sure, you know, everything's normal. We can connect to the internet. All right. Looks like we can connect to the internet. Everything's normal on this machine. So let's go ahead and, and, and get back into our scenario. We're going to pretend that this macro isn't labeled start attack. You know, it's built into the, the update currency. But let's go ahead and click that. And we hit start attack, and it's going to start simulating a, a normal macro-based attack. So we can see some bad things are happening here. Sentinel-1 has already detected this threat. And this is where typically this threat is actually going to be blocked by Sentinel-1. I have this machine set on an alert-only mode. Um, so we can kind of simulate, um, you know, what would happen if something were to get by that security and how can we fix this machine? So let's go ahead and hop into our Sentinel-1 console and I'll walk you through what the SOC is actually going to do to respond to this threat. All right, so we're in the Sentinel-1 console, and you know it doesn't matter when this alert comes in, uh, if it comes in at 10 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night, our SOC is going to have that eyes on glass to really be able to respond to these alerts You know, anytime they come in. So when we see this come in, we're going to go ahead and click on it to get a little bit more information. Right off the bat, we've got a lot of information here about what command line was launched, you know, some information about our, our endpoint itself, and then we've got these threat indicators. And these threat indicators line up with the minor attack framework. What this is, if you haven't heard of it, is it actually kind of tracks, you know, what attackers are doing and kind of classifies these into different areas. So we're seeing, you know, some persistence mechanisms, uh, some information stealing, Chrome sensitive information was accessed, some exploitation things, you know, that initial document behaving abnormally. It's not looking good. So if we need a little bit more information, we can kind of hop over to this explore tab. And this is where we can kind of follow the attack as it's taking place. So we see that initial open office, our euros to US dollars file was opened. When that macro was launched, it launched a batch file. And that batch file launched command.exe, some PowerShell, some scheduled tasks, some registry edits, you know, a lot of things that aren't looking good on that endpoint. So if we scroll down a little bit further, Kind of break down all the actions that have taken place. Um, you know, any file actions, any network actions, processes, registries, or those different threat indicators. So if I look at the network actions, I see PowerShell a couple times here, and and it's reaching out to a couple external IPs. And I I know from my my research or our crew's research, the cyber research unit, that these external IPs are known for serving up ransomware. So the first thing we're going to go ahead and do is disconnect this machine. We don't want this to 
uh, progress any further, you know, you definitely don't want it spreading to anything else on the network. So we're going to go ahead and isolate that machine while we investigate it and see what else we need to do to clean it up and remediate this attack. So as we hop back to our desktop, um, we're seeing a lot of things that, that don't look very good. Um, right here, we are getting a lot of red, uh, which means the script has stopped. Hopefully this means that, that our machine was isolated successfully, but we've got you know the normal ransomware background and some of our files are, are probably encrypted. But let's take a look here you know, at our scheduled tasks. We'll refresh this and we're seeing this malware has really started to embed itself into our, our endpoint. You know, we've got our really evil task and our evil task. Uh, so we want to make sure that when we clean this up, we get rid of, of all of this. Before we do that, we're going to go ahead and verify, you know, that our, our machine is actually isolated. You know, we can no longer communicate with the internet. We are getting that general failure. That's a good sign. Um, we'll go ahead and ping my IP address as well, just to kind of show you. It, it doesn't matter, you know, if it's a IP address or a URL. This machine is essentially isolated. The only thing it can communicate with is that Sentinel-1 console. So let's go ahead and, and put our SOC analyst hat back on, hop back into the Sentinel-1 console and get this machine cleaned up. All right, so we're back in the Sentinel-1 console. Um, you know, we can see a lot of bad things have happened on this machine. We, we definitely want to take action, um, make sure that we can get it cleaned up and get this user up and going as quickly as possible. When it comes to those mitigation actions, we've actually got a few things that we can do. Our kind of low level response is initially just kill. You know, we're going to kill all of these processes related to this threat. Next level up is quarantine. And as you can see, it kind of builds upon that. So first thing we're going to do is kill all those processes. Then we're going to quarantine um, all the files that this dropped. So the initial euros to US dollars, you know, this DTK.bat, any of the other batch files, uh, temporary files of this malware drop, we're going to remove them from the endpoint. Remediate is one of our more common methods um, that we do. It kind of undoes a lot of those file and system changes created by the threat, but I, I think we need to take this one one step further. And what we can do on our Windows machines actually is we can roll back. So we're actually going to restore any file and configuration changes that that threat had, had done to the endpoint. And we do this by rolling back to a protected shadow copy on those Windows machines. So we're going to go ahead and mark it as resolved. This is a true positive. Um, typically, what our SOC is going to do is they're going to add it to our global blacklist as well. So, you know, where this time maybe it got by that initial layer of protection before it was stopped. Now it's going to be blocked for all of our partners on that initial execution. Mark it as a true positive and hit apply. So this this the response typically takes, you know, maybe a, a minute or two. It really depends on what was actually done to the endpoint. What do we need to undo? That was actually pretty quick there. Uh, but we can see here that it actually killed 102 processes, quarantined 11 files, remediated 86 different changes on the endpoint, and we rolled back 240 uh, pieces on um, the actual endpoint itself. So I can export all this stuff. I can export this map if I need to do any reporting on it. I need to get a little bit more information, but all this was successful. So it looks like the machine is cleaned up. So let's go ahead and reconnect it. And we'll go ahead and send that reconnect signal to our endpoint. And let's go ahead and hop back into the endpoint, make sure that it is actually cleaned up. All right, guys, so we're, we're back on our endpoint here. And let's go ahead and, and kind of verify that everything was cleaned up like it should have been. So I'll refresh our schedule tasks here. And we can see that evil task and that really evil task have been removed. So that's a, a good sign. If we look at our folder here where our initial spreadsheet was, that euros to US dollar, um, it's actually been removed. You know, our background's back to the normal background here, you know, no more ransomware. Let's go ahead and make sure we're back online. And we are back online. So our machine is essentially cleaned up. You know, hopefully this user learns a little bit um, not to click all those bad macros and, and download all these crazy files. Um, but, you know, Sentinel-1 has done an awesome job. Uh, really cleaned up the endpoint, um, got it back to where we, we need to be. Unfortunately, you may have noticed there, there was probably some other pieces of this attack that we couldn't see with Sentinel-1, which really focuses on protecting our endpoints. So next up, we're going to go ahead and hop into our SIM solution 
and take a look in there and see what we can find that really gives us the full visibility and the extent of this attack. So it's a good thing the SOC is also monitoring our SIM solution, which is pulling in information from all those other sources, you know, that aren't our endpoints. Um, we are pulling in data from that Sentinel-1 integration. We're looking at Office 365 data, you know, all your network devices, your routers, switches, firewalls. We're really kind of pulling everything into one space. So when we see an alert, we can really get the full picture as to what's actually going on. So right around the same time that I see that Sentinel-1 alert, our SOC gets an alert here for a, a risky sign-on. So let's go ahead and click that. And we can see uh, right off the bat, you know, this is uh, Dustin. He's got a, a risky sign-on. If I click our Perchy bonnet here, it's going to take us to kind of where all the raw logs live. So I can see my user ID, Dustin, has logged in from a, a few different countries, it looks like. You know, we do see some United States. Um, that's probably uh, normal. You know, that is where Dustin works. Um, but if I look here, he's also logging in from China and Nigeria and France and Brazil. So that's probably not looking good. But, you know, I want to I visualize this information in kind of a more readable format. I mean, these raw logs, you know, I can definitely expand them get a little bit more information, but it's, it, it's kind of ugly. Um, you know, it's not very pleasing to look at. So if I look here into our Office 365 dashboard, I can see very quickly, you know, all these locations that Dustin is logging in successfully from within the last 24 hours. And I'm, I'm no uh, math expert here, but I don't believe you can travel to all of these places within 24 hours. It'd be pretty tough. Uh, if I, I go down here, a couple more ways that we can kind of visualize this information, you know, real quickly, I see eight logins outside the United States. Here are those logins, you know, with the different country codes. And again, you know, I can expand it to get a little bit more information. Scrolling down, I can see Dustin had those 10 successful logins. Successful logins don't always trigger an alert. You know, that looks pretty normal. But when I see they're from five different sources and eight places outside the, the United States. Here's all those specific IP addresses. Now's where we kind of tie in the two products, both the SIM and our endpoint protection. And I see, you know, the same IP that I saw in that, that Sentinel-1 attack. Now I know something's not, not normal. This is not a, a good sign. You know, we cleaned up the endpoint, but it looks like if you remember, think back, you know, when Dustin downloaded that file, he entered his Office 365 credentials. So not only did he get malware, but the attackers were able to compromise those credentials, and they probably already sold them on the dark web. So if I go back to this, this alert now, I know this is not good. Um, I need to go ahead and escalate this alert. So here I can change the status very quickly. Our SOC is going to do that. We're going to escalate that alert. We're going to type in our notes. You know, it's related to a Sentinel-1 alert. We need to review this with Dustin. We need to review logins with Dustin and verify. You know, maybe, maybe he's using a, a VPN and this isn't anything we need to worry about. But being that it, it's kind of tied to that Sentinel-1 alert, same IP address, and now all of a sudden we're seeing these logins from all over the place. It's probably not good. And this is where our SOC is going to escalate this alert to the Kyber team, and we're really going to work with them as kind of an extension of their team, you know, making sure that we respond to this alert in a very quick and efficient manner. You know, we can lock out the user account, um, you know, change the password, um, verify, you know, email forwarding rules or anything like that have been set up. And we definitely want to educate the user, kind of tell them what went on, why this happened, and how we can prevent it in the future. Now that we've responded to the, the actual alert itself, you know, we've made sure the endpoint's clean, and we've um, resolved the issues that we're seeing with Office 365, We've even got dashboards to, you know, continue to monitor that. You know, I can keep an eye on the meals, logins, make sure nothing else is coming up. And then because we do have that direct integration with Office 365, I'm able to see, you know, if any email forwarding rules are being set up. 
you know, are there any other logins that could be coming in? So I can use this dashboard to kind of monitor going forward to make sure that our environment is still safe and protected from the specific threat. So with a lot of your security tools, it's always kind of hard to, to see that value that, you know, the, the technology itself and the, the SOC is really bringing out to you. Um, because a lot of that stuff is done behind the scenes. So I've actually created this dashboard to kind of help show some of that information where, you know, you, we can see in the last month, we've collected over 95 million total logs, you know, from all these different sources, 50 million, almost 50 million from our Windows logs, you know, six and a half million from our syslogs. And our SOC is filtering down, kind of going through all that information, looking for these bad things, kind of filter that down to, you know, 30 different events that we need to investigate. Awesome. Well, I, I think um, that does a, a really decent job of kind of showing how we can use both of these technologies together and why it's important to layer on that security. And I do see there's a, a question in the chat here. Is there an API integration uh, available with help desk systems such as JIRA or ServiceNow? So we do have um, API integrations into several uh, of those, those ticketing systems, mainly uh, right now the ConnectWise Manage and Freshdesk, uh, but we're always looking at adding new ones, and I believe ServiceNow is on the roadmap, but we have email forwarding as well. So a lot of those health, help desk integrations um, can ingest emails, so we can send an email directly to it and, and create tickets like that. That's great, Dustin. Any other questions for Dustin? That's uh, That was a, a pretty amazing demonstration of how a simple click can uh, can cause a lot of damage uh, both on an endpoint and on a network. Other questions for Dustin around uh, the uh, the intensity that they uh, that they see in their organizations or how they think this might be able to help them or or questions about how it might be able to uh, help protect them in any way. I think this also uh, speaks a bit to the ransomware question that came out earlier. Um, using these types of tools, uh, well, maybe you couldn't uh, detect uh, or couldn't prevent the initial click of the ransomware using tools such as these would certainly limit the number of, uh, of endpoints that could be touched based upon the isolation features, as well as the early detection to limit the amount of damage that's actually done to the environment. All right, well, I don't see any other open questions at this time. Keep them coming. Um, and uh, Dustin, do you have any questions for our audience uh, that you want them to participate uh, in from your presentation? Um, <laughs> uh, no, I, I think I, I'm good. You know, I, I it's always good to kind of just talk security with everyone um, and trying to understand how we can layer security and, and why it's important to layer it is always good. You know, we we love the technology. It's great at hopefully preventing a lot of attacks, but that's why we have layers. You know, you talked about it as well. Um, nothing is perfect in security, so it's important to understand why we need these layers and, and why we need to kind of evolve from what we were using in the past. But no, no specific questions from me. If anybody has any more, um, I will be hanging out for any of these, the technical type questions. So, you know, feel free to post them in the chat. Great, so I'll throw one out there and Brandon, maybe you can throw this in the chat and folks, you can answer in the chat for some more participation opportunities. Um, on a scale of one to five, similar to the other polls that we did, um, what do you think, uh, how, do you, how well do you think your organization is positioned to detect this type of nefarious behavior if someone were to click on um, a malicious link or download a, uh, an infected file onto their systems? So again, scale of one to five, and you can answer in the chat uh, for participation points. How well do you think your organization is positioned to detect this type of nefarious behavior if it were happened there? And while we are waiting for those answers to come in, um, thank you, Dustin, for that fantastic uh, um, demonstration. Oh, we do have somebody who, who uh, answered about a three in, uh, in the question and answer uh, section. So um, 
That's also another way that you can submit your answer to us. Uh, great information about what to do uh, when uh, something does happen, as long as you've been proactive about putting the tools in place. Um, great, uh, great info there. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes uh, that still doesn't get catch everything. And because of that, we have another partner with us, Mike DePama from Datto today, who is going to talk a little bit about what happens when ransomware does hit your systems and the types of tools that you can have in place to recover from those quickly to limit damage to your organization and get back to operational effectiveness as quickly as possible. With that, I give you Mike DePama. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so again, my name is Mike DePalma. I'm the uh, VP of Business Development at Datto. Uh, we're a, primarily a business continuity solution provider based out of Norwalk. So uh, we're pretty close to a lot of folks here. Been around for 15 years. We're now up over 4,000 employees worldwide. Uh, and we've got nine data centers around the world protecting uh, all this business data. Uh, two here in the States, one in Pennsylvania, one out in Salt Lake City, Utah. We'll get into the importance of those locations, but we protect over an exabyte of data. So it's one of the largest private data center networks in the world. But to kind of reiterate what we've been talking about, and there's a lot of great technologies out there. Look, all the, the stuff we just saw from ConnectWise, all great technologies. But ultimately, if you were to come out of this seminar here today, you really have to understand what you need to do as a whole. And the technology is just one pillar of that. It does start with your people. Over 90% of these attacks occur because of user error. Most of the time, not malicious. It's somebody clicking on an email they're not supposed to, and these emails have gotten very, very sophisticated. You hear the phrase socially engineered spear phishing. It's because we give so much information, and we have to, out on the web. You can go to my LinkedIn page and find out where I went to college, previous employers, uh, other people I'm connected with. So now these emails are coming in, and they don't look like, hey, it's your long lost uncle. You might still get those, but those get caught up in spam filters and they don't get through. These are very targeted. It will look like every other email in your inbox and they tend to be very strategic. They try to hit you on a Friday afternoon. You look, go back and look at some of these very large attacks. They tend to happen, especially before a three day weekend because people are trying to clean up their emails at the end of the day. They might click on something they're not supposed to. And then now if somebody's not monitoring all of your systems, you got all weekend to get into as many things as possible. So it does start with simple things like training. It was great to see 63% of the folks on here do have an instant response plan. I do these webinars and, and live presentations every single week. I don't know that I've ever seen it over 50. So this is a very educated audience, which is awesome. But within that, there has to be training involved and not just an onboarding training. It really is an ongoing training. At Dato, we get an email that looks suspicious. Uh, and we see it, we're supposed to forward it over to our phishing team. And if you do it right, and it was just a fake phishing attack, you get the thumbs up, hey, congratulations, Mike. If you do click on it, you get another congratulatory email, except this one says, hey, Mike, you just enrolled yourself in a, a one hour training because you clearly haven't been listening to us, right? But then there's the process part. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, Bob said, you know, multi-factor authentication. You have to have it. It's a no-brainer. It will one day be law, the law of the land. I can tell you that an insurance company will not insure you on the cyber side unless you have MFA. You're just a non-insurable business. But with MFA, the tool is very, very strong. You could reduce these attacks. I, I've seen stats as high as 99% with a good multi-factor authentication. But there still needs to be an understanding within your organization about what this is and how to utilize it. I can give you a real-life story. Um, a partner of ours brought on a new client. The, the partner really, the, the client really wanted to understand cybersecurity because they had just been attacked and they had implemented multi-factor authentication. Um, the owner of the company within the first week of this being uh, implemented hadn't gone through the training is the owner. He didn't really see it. Uh, Saturday afternoon, he's out with his kids taking pictures on his phone. He gets a little alert that says, hey, did you just try to sign in? And he said, yes, he wanted to get that thing off his screen because he wanted to continue taking pictures. The tool didn't fail. It was the people and then the process is not being in place to understand that. And so if you really want to be secure and, I, and I'll kind of take it further and talk about cyber resilience. If you want to be a resilient business to these attacks, all the technology in the world is great, but you need to check off all three of these boxes to be prepared. And when you think about these attacks and you know, there's a lot of great ways to protect these attacks, but what is the real impact? Most of the time, the impact is that you're not that you're never going to get your data back you'll probably backing up your data and you can get it back. It's the speed in which you can recover it. And that's the leverage that these criminals have. 
Backups are great. They're only as good as the speed in which you can get that data back. And there are a lot of scary stories out there. And, and the problem is a lot of these stories do focus on the large municipalities and hospitals. So the small, the medium sized business community tends to think, A, what chance do I have? The US government was attacked. What chance do I have? Or if you just say, hey, look, that's where they're going. That's where the money is. Why are they going to attack me? My, my data is not necessarily valuable. That's the wrong mindset. The vast majority of these attacks are happening at the small to medium sized business level. Think of it this way. These criminals now, uh, it's, a, it's a corporate enterprise. This is not the single rogue person sitting in their basement. There is a structure just like every other corporation. There are the really smart folks that create this malware and the stat that Dustin gave, I hadn't heard, but it's crazy, 500,000 new uh, instances of malware every single day. But they're not typically the folks that are you know, providing, uh, you know, doing the attacks. There's another layer and I'll, I'll call them the sales team. These are the folks that are actually going out there and think of being a salesperson. You've got two different models. You could be the home run hitter who goes out and tries to attack the large co corporations that can maybe net six, seven, even eight figures uh, of ransom. Or you could be the singles hitter and just attack thousands of businesses every single day, knowing that, A, you're going to have a higher success rate right, of getting through. And also, you're going to have a higher success rate of getting these folks to pay. Because when the city of Atlanta is hit, they're not going to go out of business. They took them three months to get all of their stuff back up online. The impact there was far greater than the ask. But what do they do? They go out and they, they sell some more muni bonds or whatever they need to do. Small business doesn't have that. It's the cost of downtime. And one of the examples, and it is a large one, but I really think it's something that hits home. There was a university out in Illinois. It had been around 157 years. And they got attacked this past December, right during enrollment season. It took them three months to get all of their systems back up online. And by the time they did, enrollment had dropped to the point where they had to close their doors. They'd already been hit with some enrollment issues during COVID. This pushed them over the edge. They were not able to process those. And now they've closed their doors. 157 years, this college has been a, a up and running and they were closed, not because they were never able to get their data back. They got it back. It was, again, the cost of that downtime. And that's the leverage that they have. And you know, I'm fortunate if I do a lot of presentations alongside folks from go different governmental agencies, FBI, Department of Homeland Security. And they've always stated that you're not supposed to pay the ransom. You know, it puts a bigger bullseye on your back. On a macro level, it emboldens these folks. Um, one of the scarier stats I've seen, if you aggregated all of the money that these cyber criminals make on a yearly basis, they would be the ninth largest economy in the world, larger than Canada, larger than Brazil. That's the kind of money that's being spent. And it's because they, they're emboldened. They don't have to change their model. It keeps working. So they've always kind of said, hey, don't pay the ransom. But finally, the, the Department of, uh, Treasury Department back in December of 2020 put out an official statement where they said, not only you shouldn't pay it, but if you do pay, you're actually at risk of violating the law. Now, paying a ransom is not illegal. If I'm doing this seminar and somebody steals my dog, I can pay the ransom to get that dog back if I want to. The reason why this ransomware epidemic is different is because a lot of times, unfortunately, the folks behind these attacks, they're terrorist organizations. They are enemy nation states. We see it every single day. And so by paying that ransom, you could inadvertently be breaking the law, obviously funding some of these terrorist groups. Now, the statement itself doesn't have a lot of teeth to it because almost universally, they're going to ask for that money in some form of cryptocurrency, typically Bitcoin. Um, but the reason behind that is, A, it just, there's, it's almost impossible to get caught. You go and, and you, you could ask for an ACH payment or a credit card payment, and you might not get it back. Instead, they're asking for it in Bitcoin because once that money's gone, it's almost impossible to track or get back. But the other reason they do this is because of the money that they're making off of Bitcoin. Everybody has a friend who made a ton of money when the Bitcoin surge happened, right? And they brag about it. That's great, great success story, right? Or the, the genius investor that did that. But take a step back and look at what the criminals have been doing. They've been, this, ransomware's been around 30 years. We really started to see an uptick around 2013, 2014. They're asking for the money in Bitcoin. That's when Bitcoin was under $100. So they're accumulating millions of dollars in Bitcoin when it's worth $100. Now, when it spikes to $60,000, yeah, those are your friends made a lot of money. The criminals made hundreds of thousands, of, hundreds of millions of dollars overnight when that spike occurred. And even though it's come down, it's still, think about them if you had bought Bitcoin at $100. So there's also that business mindset to it. So you really have to understand why it's important not to pay that ransom. Uh, the other piece is we know only about 25% of these attacks are reported to authorities. Um, one of the reasons is, Look, the FBI doesn't put out a stat or a number of when they start looking to into these incidents. 
I've heard $100,000, I've heard $250,000. The reality is if somebody's attacking a small business and asking for $20,000, they want you to report it, um, but go to ICS.gov and you could report one of those. They want to do that, but they know that most of the time they're not gonna put any resources into it. They wanna see if there's trends and things like that. But the other major piece is that nobody wants to be known uh, as the company in your area, in your industry that's been attacked. The impact of that business, the ripple effects tends to be far greater than even the, the monetary value. And that's why so many people pay. They want to put you in that situation. Go ahead. You want to pay me $10,000 or do you want to release all your information? And now you're on the front page of the paper. So the government has now implemented a new piece where you have to report an attack within 72 hours. And if you do pay the ransom, you have to report that within 24 hours. And so all of these regulations, I get, you know, why the government needs to do that, but they're not helping to catch any of these folks. They're not helping to prevent the attacks. What they're doing is they're shifting that burden over to you, over to the business owner, saying it's your responsibility to protect your data, your client data, your employee data. Because even if you're able to survive one of these attacks, we're going to come knocking on your door and you better be able to slide across the table one of those incident response plans. You better be able to show that you did everything to meet those regulations, because if not, now you've got fines and all the rest coming behind it. So um, there was actually an incident very recently. Um, I think it came out last week. There was a clothing company who was attacked and they did not handle it properly at all. They tried to, to un sweep it under the rug, not provide any information. Uh, state of New York just sued them for $1.9 million because they weren't handling it in the proper manner. And so we at that, we live and breathe the ransomware stuff. I've been given ransomware presentations. I've been here eight years. We've been doing it for eight years. Um, and eight years ago, I'd be standing on stage and people would be looking at their phones. It's ransomware. It's happening at the large levels, right? Um, now, as time's gone on, you see a lot more head nods. You see a lot more folks that are, are either been attacked themselves. They're just reading stories in the news or they've got a client or a competitor who's been hit and we do we use a lot of third party data but we also do our own internal report every single year we look at the state of ransomware mostly focused on the small business community and we want to get our own numbers and what we've seen is that you know there's been a a huge growth in this uh but you know we saw a big spike in healthcare over the last year uh over the last couple of years why because that is where you know they had the most pressure on it that's the industry during covid and a lot of pressure on it. So they were getting a lot of money out of these hospitals that couldn't be down. They, they couldn't go down. They couldn't shut all their services down. But I think if you take a step back and you look at it, every single industry is vulnerable to these attacks. Um, because with a genius behind ransomware is that they don't necessarily care if your data is valuable to them on the dark web, whether they could buy and sell it. What they care about is they know that in this day and age, you cannot operate without access to that data. And so it allows them to cast this huge net. You could be a, you know, Fortune 500 company, or you could be a one or two person nonprofit. Any, either, whatever size business you are, whatever industry you're in, you need access to that. So they know they could hold that ransom. Uh, they could make a lot of money. Now, all the great tools that we saw are extremely important. I think Dustin really ended very strong. We talked about that multi-layered approach. When we looked at the folks that were attacked, six and 10 of them had that anti-malware filtering in place, endpoint detection. A quarter of them had that. Again, it's not that you shouldn't have this. It's a very important part of that multi-layered approach, but it shows you that nothing is foolproof. Even uh, a couple of years ago, it might've been last year, uh, FBI Director Ray was on the floor of Congress getting grilled about the attack, rightly so, on the US government, but he was very open. He looked them in the eyes and said, there's nobody that can tell you that they're, they're gonna have a solution in place that's gonna protect you from every single attack that's happening today or the ones that are happening tomorrow. It's an ever growing race. That's why you have to look at this as a holistic approach. This is not a commodity you can go out and buy. Your first call after this shouldn't be, hey, Bob, what do I need to buy? Because there isn't a single product. And a lot of folks they think they could handle it on their own. You know, when you listen to ads uh, you know, on, the, on Sirius XM or you see billboards and there's all these great products and they are great products, but it needs to be part of a holistic approach because there's nothing that's gonna prevent somebody in your office from not following all the processes in place and allowing and opening the door to one of these criminals coming in. And when we look at the actual impact of these attacks, again, it's not necessarily that you're never going to get your data back. It's the downtime. It's the loss of productivity. This is where the real cost comes into play. Um, some stats that we've seen in our internal report, uh, the average length of downtime uh, from one of these attacks, about 20 days. Uh, I did a presentation last week with a 
person from the cyber uh, insurance space, their number was 24 days. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security says 16.2 days. So they're all pretty much the same piece. We're not talking about minutes or hours uh, to get your, and it's not just getting your data back. It's getting everybody in your office back into a production environment, all the tools that they need. You need to get back to that point so you can start servicing your clients and generating revenue. Um, we're talking about, on average, several weeks to get this data back. And there'll be numbers about what that costs. And I can remember three years ago doing presentations like this and saying, hey, look, 2018, the average ransomware payment was only about $4,300. The average impact to that business is 10 times greater. It's over $46,000, right? Eye-opening stat. People take out their phones and take a picture. Look where those numbers have gone. The average payment hasn't gone up drastically. But the average impact, according to our study, and again, this is just a small business community, over $300,000. That cyber insurance uh, agent that was up there giving their stats, it was $1.4 million. Uh, the US government says about $1.7 million. Now these numbers, the, the problem I have with these numbers is that you can't necessarily take this general number and say, this is what a ransomware attack, this is the cost, because everybody in this seminar is going to have a different cost, whether, you know, where you're highly transactional, um, how large you are, the industry you're in. So the mindset needs to be individually, what would it cost us to be down for a day, a week, 16 days, 20 days, 24 days? What would that cost us? Because the criminals know this math. That's why they price the ransom at a much more attractive rate than you trying to go and restore from the backups that you have. They're always going to want you to do that math. This math right here. Go ahead and pay me $5,600, not enough to break the bank, or go ahead and try to restore your data. We know on average it's going to cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not into the seven figures. This is the math that they know, and this is why they're so successful. And this is why the business, smaller to medium-sized business community is such an attractive target because they can't survive this. We know about 60% of businesses that are attacked and are down for a week or more close their doors within 12 months. They just can't survive it, um, both because of the loss of revenue, but the, also the ripple effects that I mentioned, losing clients, you losing prospects, um, all of the rest. Uh, losing staff. Some of the big things that we've seen is that we're in this market where it's very hard to retain staff. We all know that, regardless of what industry you're in. If all of a sudden this staff is dealing with a ransomware attack and it's 20 days of chaos, and toxicity, they're gonna to start looking. And we've seen real life examples of that, where now you're gonna also lose quality staff because they're gonna find jobs out there. There's so many jobs for them to take. Um, but the scariest stat to me, being somebody that goes out and does a lot of educational uh, webinars and, and, and in-person seminars, is that when we looked at the small business community, we talked to managed service providers like Kyber, 84% of them said that everybody should be highly concerned. When we talked to the business owners themselves, only three in 10, only three in 10. Now this crowd seems to be a lot more advanced because we've got, as was shown before, 63% in that first survey was, was pretty awesome. And I, you know, I'm, I'm glad you guys are all doing that. But what this really tells us is the criminals are gonna have a banner year. We run these reports from uh, July 1st to, to June 30th. Our new report will be coming out this month. I guarantee you, it'll be a banner year for these criminals. They're gonna make a lot of money because they don't have to change anything that they're doing. It's a cash cow and still only 30% of folks are highly concerned about this stuff. Um, the problem is, it, 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 scarier part of that, last year's report, it was 41%. It went in the wrong direction. And maybe that was because of the job market that we're in right now, or you know, still the ripple effects from COVID. It'd be a lot of different things. But the fact that it's going in the wrong direction shocks me because you can't go on any website right now and not find some sort of cyber attack. It's just inundated with us. So maybe it's just white noise. Maybe it's, this will never happen to me. Um, but you know, the cliche term, it's not a matter of if, but when really does apply. And so you really have to make sure that you have all of those uh, systems in place, that multi-layered approach to yes, prevent all of these attacks, but also to have something in place to make sure your business is resilient. I will tell you that they do follow the path of least resistance. There's a lot of low hanging fruit. You do not wanna be part of that 70% um, because if you can show that you've got systems in place, especially in the smaller business community, they're gonna move on to the next piece. It's just a numbers game. Um, you know, like I said, it's a corporate, corporate structure. There are buildings on earth right now. There are people sitting around the water cooler talking about you know, who they think is gonna win the World Series and all the rest. And when their break's over, they're gonna sit down at their desk and they're gonna have a quota to hit and they're gonna to try to attack as many businesses as possible. So the more efficient way is just to find that 70%. 
Um, that being said, they're still going to attack everybody. So you have to have these systems in place. So the conversation, and I think Bob did a great job of, of laying out what that, that NIST framework looks like, but the conversation really needs to shift. Every single presentation I do, everybody, it's called something about cybersecurity, and that's great. It needs to be kind of just pounded home. But you really need to think about cyber resilience. How resilient is your business? Yes, you want to be as secure as possible. You want to eliminate as much risk as possible. But if something happens, the key here is how resilient you are. And that's really those last three uh, check boxes that Bob had mentioned. Yes, your first step after all of this is to start with that identification process. Let's figure out everything you had. We're going to put in a great protection plan in place. These are all the tools. We saw a great demonstration on what those tools look like. But what happens if something gets through? Um, we saw some stuff about that detection. Do you know, and is it in your incident response plan, who is responsible for detecting these things that happen? Uh, you know, the first thing they're going to want to do when they get in there is not necessarily send you the scary red screen that says, hey, pay me some ransom, the clock is ticking. No, they want to get their hands into everything. So again, when you go back to the, your, your ICR or you go back and look at that people, process, and technology, start with something simple. What, who has access to what? Does everybody have access to all the tools they need? Yeah, hopefully they do. But do they only have access to the things they need? We saw a lot of this during COVID when a lot of new software as a service applications were sent out there. Um, everybody just carte blanche gets admin access. That is a gold mine for the criminals. You need to understand that. At Datto, I don't have access. I don't even, I'm not in sales. I don't even have access to the quoting tool um, because they don't want me getting into anything. I have access to everything that I need but I don't have access to get into devices and, and troubleshoot or anything like that because it's not part of my job. Um, make sure that you have that. Within that as well, we have this thing called shadow IT where you know a lot of times you're using applications, important applications that, that contain important business data that other departments don't even know exist. So until you, go, until you go in and do that inventory, it's impossible to put together a plan. So you go through that detection and then who's jumping in and responding to that? Um, you know. I tell you, if a fire alarm goes off, most people know what to do. In my previous job, if I clicked on something I wasn't supposed to and got a scary red screen, my first reaction is probably not to walk down the hallway and tell my boss. First reaction is going to be, hey, let me try to fix this on my own or call some of my buddies that are super technical and say, hey, uh, what do I have to do here? Well, hey, the time is ticking and they tend to increase the ask as the time goes by, but also they're getting their hands into everything that they need to. And so who's detecting it? And then who's responding to it? And then ultimately, what does that recovery uh, process look like? Do you do regular, at least annual, dis you know, disaster recovery, uh, you know, tests? Are you testing so you can answer that question of how long uh, I will be down? When you look and take a step back and you look at this full circle, I just mentioned the stats. On average, this, this will take you 16 to 24 days to close this circle and get back. That's something a lot of businesses can't absorb. And so you really need to understand that and what that looks like. So I like to look at it more on a linear basis because I think it's a little under, easier to understand. And our chief information and security officer always talks about it in terms of the right-hand side of the boom, the boom being this attack. Now the boom could even be you know, a, a hurricane or a natural disaster, whatever it is that's causing that downtime, that's the boom. All of the things that you're doing, a lot of the things that we saw um, in terms of protection, that's that left-hand side of the boom extremely important that the way that these criminals make money is relying on that right-hand side of the boom because they understand this and, and the left-hand side of the boom while you're putting all your protections in place that's when they're doing that reconnaissance that's when they're going out and, and trying to find out some information about your business so that when that in, that comes in it looks like every other email i actually did a, uh, it was a couple of years ago i was down in pennsylvania the fbi an fbi agent was the keynote there's this is a large presentation probably two three hundred people in the crowd so he's up there and he's giving all the scary stats. And then all of a sudden he shows this picture of a house, beautiful house, you know, suburb, suburban house. He says, does anybody recognize this house? And somebody in the crowd was like, that's my house. And it's a beautiful house. And you just got a promotion at work. That's great. It's just rattling off all these stats about this person. And he says, I bet you think I use all the tools at my disposal, right? To get all, I'm in the FBI, right? I can use all these tools. Like, Not at all. I got a list of registrants for this event who had confirmed and I picked one of you at random. And I tried to look you up on LinkedIn. I knew your business. I knew your name. Now I knew your face. So it's a lot easier for me to find you on Facebook. That's where I got this. Uh, this particular individual had gone to Penn State, one of the largest alumni associations in the world. That probably gets a lot of information. He said, my first thing I would do is I would 
create an email template looks like every other email you've gotten from this alumni association it's going to say click here to find out all the information about your 20-year reunion or whatever was coming up you're going to click on it because it looks like every other email in your inbox they're probably going to send it on a friday afternoon that's we're going to catch you you know asleep at the wheel he said that didn't work i got a lot of other things i could do this linkedin mining type of uh attack where I could find out and make it look like it's coming from a previous employer or somebody that you've connected with and I've seen you you interact with on LinkedIn. And so that's the type of reconnaissance they're doing. And then they try to weaponize that and create, you know, whatever that tool is that they're going to try to attack you and then boom hits. Okay, now they've gotten through. What are they trying to do? Well, this is where they're, you know, trying to install all that malware in as many places as possible. The first thing they're going to do is try to attack your backups. Um, they're going to just try to get in there and encrypt those backups so that when you do detect it and you say, OK, let's start this restoration. Oh, my backups have been encrypted for the last several weeks and now I can't even restore that. Now they've got the leverage because if you can't restore those backups. You've got really no other uh, you know, recourse but to pay. So that right hand side of the boom is where that cyber resilience comes in. The boom occurs. Do you know and can you answer those three steps and how that works? The other way to look at it, and we could all acronym you to death, we've heard a bunch of them already, right? EDR and all the ICRs and all these things. But the two that are very, very important that you need to answer and should be in your incident response plan are your RPO, this is the easier answer for you to get, which is your recovery point objective. How much data are you at risk of losing? Um, is Are you taking hourly backups? And you're saying, okay, an hourly backup is something I can absorb. Um, maybe it's daily, maybe you're not highly transactional, whatever that is, but you need to define that. What's my recovery point objective? And am I meeting that objective? Now, the caveat to this star on the left is if you're not testing those backups. You can't answer this question because you could say we've been taking hourly backups, but you don't know who's monitoring those backups or how they're being tested. You get attacked and you go in and find out your back has been failing for three months. Now that star jumps from one hour to three months. And if you can't, if you're not taking care of that left hand side of the screen, again, now they that's a big piece of leverage they have and you're going to pay the ransom. But they do know that most businesses are backing up their data in some form or fashion. There's very few business owners I talk to that aren't backing it up at all. So the real leverage is here, recovery time objective. How much downtime can you incur before it really starts to severely impact your business? Um, can you answer that question? Is it two hours? Is it two weeks? Is it 25 days, whatever that is, you need to be able to answer that question. And normally you talk to somebody and they say, what's your recovery time objective? It's two minutes. I, I can't lose any time. You got to be realistic in this, but you really need to answer that question because again, the math starts to, you know, starts up right away after that boom. And every minute costs you money. And they know that if it's going to take you three weeks to get back up and running, well, you're going to pay the ransom. And they know that. And you know, it's, it, they're, they're very strategic in what they charge too. Um, there's a lot of interesting variants out there. One of them uh, uses what's called the Big Mac Index, a term that I'd never heard before. Uh, Forbes uses it to say you could tell the, the kind of uh, worth of an area, a geographical area, by the cost of a Big Mac. You think about it, you go to Manhattan, the Big Mac might cost you, I don't know, six bucks or whatever it might be. You go up, you know, to Albany or something like that, maybe it's, you know, three dollars, two dollars, wherever it might be. And so they're going to base their ask based on the region that you're in. It's very interesting. So they're going to ping back. It's going to say, okay, this is in Los Angeles. Well, I can get a lot of money. Um, this is in some smaller town. I'm not going to get as much. But again, they're going to try to structure that where, hey, you've got two options here. Go ahead and restore or pay me some money. And that money is probably going to be at a lesser rate. Now, obviously, I mentioned all the reasons why you don't want to pay. One of the things is when I say it puts a bigger bullseye on your back, um, you know, it's like the bully in the cafeteria. You give them your lunch money one day, they're going to expect that lunch money. So now that you've shown that you pay, they're going to go and keep attacking you until you could prove that you're not a vulnerable business. And so there's a lot of reasons not to. So you really have to understand this and this needs to be part of the plan. And this will go into not just protecting your business, but you go and try to get a, a cybersecurity insurance plan. They're going to want to know these these numbers, too. Um, they're going to look at you as a you know a smoker or non smoker. They're going to they're dealing with a lot of issues in that space right now in terms of the underwriting. Uh, that industry actually lost money last year. Insurance industry doesn't lose money. So they are looking at their underwriting uh, you know, policy and saying, okay, we're gonna deem a lot of businesses uninsurable. And if you're not doing the basic things, your rate is gonna be so high that it's almost impossible to afford, or your coverage is gonna be so low that you're gonna pay for it. And you know, the impact might be a million dollars to you, but your, cover your coverage is only 250,000. So I think that even if you're not in the market for cyber insurance, 
and I'm not endorsing anything. I have no skin in the game here. Going through that exercise, just getting the application and finding out whether you're insurable is a great exercise because it should be a red flag if an insurance company is telling you you are uninsurable as a business to us. That should be a bunch of red flags. Going through that application, which used to be very short, now it's like a little book, um, and understanding, can I check off all these boxes? But more importantly, uh, do I know why the boxes exist? Why is this important to an insurance company? Um, now that they're doing, you know, they're kind of changing their, their actuary tables, they're understanding the businesses that don't do this cost us more money in the long run. So I just think it's a, it's a great exercise. And so when you look at it, and I'm going to bring on my colleague in a couple of minutes, who's actually going to show you what this looks like. When you talk about resilience, you're really talking about continuity of operations. And so, you know, at Datto, you know, we've been in the backup business for a long time, but I always say, you know, don't talk about backup. Yes, we're backing up your data and it's uh, all being, uh, you know, tested and it goes off to those two data centers. You know, I mentioned one in Pennsylvania, one in Utah. Simply put, why do we choose those locations? They're on opposite sides of the country. Um, you want to have that geo redundancy because there are natural disasters that occur. Um, you know, we get those hurricanes down in Florida at any given time, there's thousands of businesses operating out of our data centers. So you want that geographical redundancy You kind of follow the three, two, one model, three copies of your data, you know, two different formats, and then one uh, and definitely off site. And so that's what you have to follow. But when you think of continuity of information, uh, of operations, traditionally, since data has existed, backup has been at the file and folder level. You're going to tell some device, or maybe you're sending it to the cloud. It says, here's the files and folders that I need backed up. And that's great. That's how backup has been done. At the end of the day, although we're dating back to the floppy disk, this is just a bunch of files and folders. What we're trying to do is capture everything because you need all of these things. So we take an actual full image of that server or that critical workstation and capture, yes, all the files and folders and all the volumes there, but also the operating system, the application, everything that lives on that server is replicated to would be an on-premise device and then subsequently sent off to those two data centers. And so now you've got three full copies of your data. It gives you the ability to do a couple of different things. When you look at that RPO, you'll sit down and go through, okay, my RPO goal is hourly. Okay, we're gonna set up this schedule. These backups are gonna go along hourly. They're all gonna be tested. If there is some sort of failure, you're gonna be immediately re uh, alerted to it. And that's great. When it, but during those backups, what's happening is first you take that full base image and get ever, all the data. What's happening with those subsequent backups is it's not taking full backups. It's just taking backups of the incremental changes that are occurring between those two points in time. And it allows us to create what's called an inverse chain, meaning all of those backup points are independent of one another. They're completely independent instances in time. So I mentioned, what are the criminals going to try to do? They're going to try to get into your backups and see how far back they can go. Well, with this, if you get hit at 11 o'clock, you know that that 10 o'clock backup is secure. There's no way they can go in and, and infect that. And it also gives you the ability on the detection side to detect ransomware when it occurs. And it's not looking for all the, any sort of individual variant that's out there that was mentioned, you know, there's so many coming out every day. Instead, what it looks at at a more high level is it looks at the footprint that all of these attacks leave. And we had a bunch of engineers have a lot of fun sitting in there getting actual ransomware viruses and attacking uh, a server to figure out, uh, you know, what these attacks look like. Because essentially all these backups are going along and the data change is relatively similar, right? And, uh, whether it's hourly, what could be as often as five minutes, but they're all relatively similar. Now all of a sudden ransomware occurs and everything changes, it's going to jump off the screen and say something happened here. Now it could be a false positive. Maybe you did need to take a full backup, but that alert's going to go out right away. And it's also going to show you, here's the last clean backup that you have. But ultimately what it gives you the ability to do is change your mindset in terms of what that response is. Bill down the hall, doesn't sit through a webinar like this, doesn't go through the training, and clicks on an email he's not supposed to. Now he's been infected. Wait some time, now that's getting access to everything he had access to. And now the server is encrypted. The, the, the typical mindset is, okay, what do we have to do? We've got to start restoring from those backups. Um, we got to get all this data back up so we can get you know everybody back up and running. With business continuity, that first step is actually different because all of that data lives on what would be an on-premise device and then subsequently in the cloud. Um, your first reaction is to say, hey, I need to get everybody back up and running. And what this de uh, device allows you to do is actually virtualize a virtual instance of that server. So again, now all of a sudden everybody's got access to everything that they need. Typically what happens at the local level, folks don't even know that occurred. 
Um, you, you're, everybody's got access to what they need. While the tech team is in there doing forensics and figuring out if any data was stolen, wiping that device clean, ordering a new server. In that meantime, you're up and running. Everybody's got access to what they need. Uh, you're, you're taking active backups in that state. So now new servers in place, now you start that restoration process and get your business back to where you were, not when Bill clicked on the email, but instead where you were the moment that that server is in place, because you could actually start that restoration while you're still in that virtualized state. So what this essentially does is it reduces downtime to what's essentially an inconvenience as opposed to a business threatening event. You're talking about minutes or hours, a few phone calls um, over to Bob and his team to make sure that this virtualization is up and running. Uh, you're going to be able to start answering those RTO and RPO questions. Chris will show you, but all of this virtualization capability is tested every single night as well. Brought up to a boot screen, there's a snapshot take, it's called screenshot verification with the timestamp. So you know, coming on Monday morning, not only is my all my backups secure, but all these cool virtualization capabilities have been tested as well. And then ultimately you could do that either locally from the device or from either one of those data centers. So regardless of what's happening, whether it's a natural disaster, whether it's a cyber attack, you have that resiliency. We're talking about minutes or hours instead of days or weeks, because now what leverage do those criminals have? They, you know, if it, with a ransomware attack, you, you know you're gonna be able to restore your data, you know you're gonna be able to reduce that downtime, so why would you pay, right? Now, what we've seen too, is you know the way data stored and we talk about data sprawl and all these things the way business is done nowadays is different than it. it used to be super simple here's my windows server sitting on site where all my data lives and that's great now out of necessity really to stay up and running our data lives in a lot of different places especially we saw an increase um as we started this kind of work from anywhere environment that occurred during covid but we're still seeing the stats saying that businesses are still allowing employees to do that mostly because of this job market we're in if you're not allowing people to work remote your competitor probably is and they're going to get some talent and so we have all this data that lives in a lot of places we knew in the tech space that this time was going to come there's going to be a time we talk about kind of home office in a box we just accelerated a matter of probably 10 years in a matter of 10 months out of necessity and that's great all these tools are great that's what allowed us to stay up and running but within our report we saw that one in four of our partners, our managed service providers, we don't sell direct, we only sell through the channel. Um, one in four of them did see clients who had attacks on those SaaS applications, other applications, software as a service applications. Now, the majority of those came through Microsoft 365. We did see it in, in G Suite and Dropbox and all the rest. Um, that doesn't mean that Microsoft 365 is less secure. It's just that they are the huge owner of so much data. So they're gonna continue to go after that. So why we still see attacks on Windows-based servers because 90 plus percent of all business data that is on premise lives on a windows based server so they're opportunistic they're going to go after wherever that data lives and that was our study but regardless of where you digest your news you're going to see story after story um, just do a quick google search of microsoft 365 attacks um, we're continue to see it and it's not brute force attacks into microsoft it's not saying that microsoft doesn't work we use it right where we use microsoft 365 um, but what it does say is that majority of these attacks still occur because of user error, it's somebody opening the door. And Microsoft and Google are very open about this shared responsibility model, where yeah, they're gonna protect the integrity of their cloud, and I'm, I'm a criminal, it's gonna be much more difficult for me to brute force my way into Microsoft's cloud. Um, but you are, as a tenant, are responsible for your data. And again, I've seen presentations, we do a lot of joint presentations with them, where they're very honest with the audience. And basically all of your SaaS applications are gonna have this. If somebody opens the door and lets people in, that's not Microsoft's responsibility. So yeah, they're great tools, but you still have responsibility on your end as the tenant, as the owner of that data. And they're very open with it, it's in their SLA, on their message boards, um, in, in your agreement. But they're not liable for that. And they actually encourage that data to be backed up as well. Wherever data lives, that's criminal. That goes back to, it's critical. That goes back to that identification process, wherever it lives. And it lives in a lot of different places. How are you protecting that data? Doing all the things that Dustin had showed in terms of not letting anybody get through, but also how are you backing up that data? What does a recovery process look like? Um, you know, when, when Facebook goes down for 10 minutes, the world comes to an end. Everybody's screaming on Twitter and all the rest, right? That's the world we live in. We need access to everything really, really fast, right? And so you need to make sure that that data is protected. We think about also the sophistication of these folks. Um, you wanna Google a pretty interesting story is a guy named uh, Kevin Mitnick. Uh, at one point, he was a notorious hacker, one of the most notorious hackers in the world back in the 90s, when the FBI's most wanted list. He got caught, went to jail. 
came out of jail. Now he works for the good guys. It's kind of like the you know, movie Catch Me If You Can. He works for the good guys, an ethical hacker. And he talks about what's, uh, you know, what's happening and what he would be doing if he was still a criminal. We hired him. We have a, a large uh, conference every year, Datacom. We get 2,000, 3,000 MSPs there. And we hired him to come out on stage with two different laptops. And he said, this is what I would be doing today. And this was in June 2019, pre-pandemic. This is what I'd be doing today because I see where the trends are going. I would be focusing on Microsoft. They coined the term ransom cloud. And he gave a demo, not of a click through. This is what might happen. I could actually give you a video of the recording. It's about 10 minutes long. But what he said is, this is what I'd be doing. It's a live virus that he showed. Is I'm going to send out an email. Again, it's going to try to look like every email in your inbox. Anti-spam pro. Now, because it was a demonstration, he did leave a couple things that are red flags. Again, it goes back to training about what you should be looking for. But he did it pretty good. Hey, whatever your name is. It wasn't high customer. It was whoever your name is. Um, you know, it's part of this, you sit through a webinar, I got to update my anti-spam, that's great. All you got to do is accept this and you can get going and they'll send it out in the morning at eight o'clock. So, you know, you got a meeting at nine, let me do this update real quick while I'm making some coffee or whatever it is. And then once you click on that, now every single email has been encrypted. And what he does is he leaves the, the title, the headline in that email there because he wants you to get even more nervous. Like, oh, I got to open this email. Oh, this is an invoice I got to process, but I can't. To make it more sense of urgency back to that other piece of who has access to what that admin access this could now migrate to the entire domain and the only email you can click on is this pretty red screen which is pretty standard in terms of uh ransomware and it's paying me some money and i'll unencrypt this stuff now think about he was thinking about this in 2019 the, the, the increase in the amount of users using microsoft's product has just gone crazy over the last couple of years and again out of necessity think about how much this has evolved if he was thinking about it, so were the criminals. They are opportunistic. They jumped in during the pandemic and started sending out spoofing emails that looked like they came from the World Health Organization or the CDC days after this pandemic really hit because they were poised to do these types of things. And they were getting a lot of people to click on it. Um, these are evil people. So they know how to do that. So hey, think about how that's evolved over the last three years, three plus years. Yeah, they're very sophisticated and they're going to find where that data lives. And as data starts to move up, to these SaaS applications, they're going to follow it. And it's an ongoing battle because unfortunately, a lot of the best and the brightest are going to the dark side right now. Um, so at this point, I'm going to make sure Chris is here um, to shake, kind of show you exactly what this looks like. So I'm going to stop my share. Uh, Chris, uh, one of our senior technical account managers, worked for them for the last eight years. He's seen it all. Um, so I'm going to let him take it over. So Chris, you want to uh, share your screen and take over, buddy? Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you so much. All right, let me share my screen so you guys can see what's going on here. All right. Okay. So what we're looking at right here, this is a local data appliance uh, that's on my network that's performing backups uh, at an hourly rate uh, to all some critical servers, physical and virtual, uh, and uh, and my desktop as well. This page just kind of gives you like an overview in terms of like what those uh, production machines are, you know, when the last backup was, you know, Mike had discussed uh, screenshot verification. So these are on here as well. There's a few different ways to receive uh, updates in terms of like how they've been coming along, but you can see right here, like on my server, 2016, last screenshot did last night, you know, today successful. So if I hover over that. So, you know, Mike mentioned these data appliances are acting hypervisors. So what that means is not only are they performing backups, they're also loaded with something called KVM, kernel virtual machine. So since these data appliances are Linux based, so from an operating system perspective, uh, KVM is native to Linux. So instead of using like Hyper-V or VMware, we use KVM. So, you know, when you're not doing any sort of manual, you know, fun in terms of like creating virtualizations, we've automated a way, you know, in terms of like, and you decipher, you know, at what point of the day you want it to occur, where we will automatically spin up a virtual instance of a particular backup, make sure it gets up to the control to lead screen and take a screen grab of it. So it just kind of gives you the warm and fuzzies that like, hey, you know, like everything I've been working on all day long is actually in a bootable state. So if I, not only if I need to, you know, recover from it, you know, in terms of like pull individual files, you know, or, you know, export like a, a VMDK back to my hypervisor or do bare metal restore back to a physical appliance. Um, it's actually bootable. So from a business continuity perspective, I could also, you know, continue to run that aspect or part of my business. So pretty cool stuff. 
Um, so let's go into the restore tab here. So the restore tab gives you all the different options that you can do in terms of recoveries and virtualizations, you know, for all the different production machines that you might be backing up. It's a very simple UI. So first column, choose a system. So these are all just those different servers and workstations and virtual machines that I'm backing up. If I choose one, so I'll just choose like my desktop, for example, it gives me a list of the different types of recoveries that I can do. So granular file restores, uh, you know, volume level restores, actually pretty good, you know, for doing like a debugging. If you want to compare and contrast, you know, one recovery of one volume to a, a production, you know, volume, I kind of like doing that. The virtualization options, so I'll go over those in a few moments, and then some exporting in terms of recovery options. So ESX upload, if you want to upload a VMDK directly back into your uh, VMware host, you can do that directly through here. Bare metal restore, that's just doing a full on re-imaging back to typically a physical piece of hardware. You can do virtual if you want, but uh, we have other methods of doing virtual. And then exporting images. So the cool thing about the export image, so yes, this gives you the ability to take a backup and export it, you know, into like say a VMDK or a VHD to go back to your hypervisor. So whether you're running Hyper-V or VMware, but the cool thing about export image is that we don't actually care what the initial inception was, like what the initial format was. So let's say, so let's say you want to do a, a P to V, like a physical to virtual. Let's say that you have like a, some physical servers and you're looking to migrate them to VMware or Hyper-V. We can take those backups and then reformat them into a VHD, a VHDX, or a VMDK. So that's why I call it a P to V. So if someone's looking to do a migration of physical to virtual, this is a great tool to do that. As far as the uh, the virtualizations go, so remember I said these are acting hypervisors, so local virtualization, pretty self-explanatory. I'm going to take a recovery point and just mount a virtualization directly off of that data appliance, uh, leveraging KVM. The other options in here, so virtualizing the cloud, so this is just saying like, hey, you know, maybe I want to go back to an older recovery point that's not housed in my local appliance, but it's housed in the cloud. Um, I have the ability to do that through here. Or let's just say like, you know, I'm running multiple local virtualizations off my data appliance and I kind of want to grab some resources from somewhere else. I can have them all run in conjunction with each other and, you know, ought to have a few run out of the cloud simultaneously to the local virtualizations. Virtualize via hypervisor. So one of my probably favorite options. So this gives you the ability to tap into an existing hypervisor. So like Hyper-V or VMware. And instead of leveraging KVM to be the main engine of spinning up the virtual instance, you're actually leveraging Hyper-V or VMware and the associated resources, you know, on that on that host in terms of RAM and CPU. Um, I would probably do virtualized via hypervisor if I knew that I was actually going to look to export or recover back to a specific host. Uh, so that's kind of the beauty of, of virtualized via hypervisor. If I virtualize via hypervisor, I could go into say VMware, for example, I'll suddenly see this new VM spun up alongside all my production VMs. Uh, it'll be identifiable by its corresponding IP address and do a V motion or a cloning like right back into production from there. Uh, but first I want to show you, you know, I'm going to show you two different recovery options. I'll show you a granular file restore and a local virtualization, you know, it's for uh, time intensive purposes. So granular file level restore. On the right side now that I've chosen that, it gives me a list of all my recovery points to choose from. So remember I said I'm doing hourly backups uh, during business hours, start file restore. And then it gives you the option, you know, after you mount it off the data appliance of how you want to access this data. So essentially all you're doing is like you're creating a bridge from your data appliance to this mounted recovery point. And I can access the data either via a Samba share or via a web interface. So web interface would be like, hey, like I'm not on the network, you know, so I want to be able to grab it like through the web. But more often than not, you're probably going to grab the Samba share here. And you can see it's just a direct path to the data appliance. That's what that 10.0.32.95 IP address is. That's the IP address of my data appliance. So I'm going to grab this entire path and just copy and paste it right in my search bar. And then there is the C and the D drive from that particular recovery point. Um, and then you can drill down through the directories, grab any files and folders you want, copy and paste where need be. Pretty simple, sleek, and easy. You know, it's a it's a UI we're all familiar with. It's just Windows Explorer. There's the IP address once again of the data appliance. That's the timestamp that I chose, you know, from a recovery point perspective. And then the C drive going through the directories. And then when I'm done, I unmount it. So it's not available anymore on the network. And it's gone back to like the way it was. So let's go back to the virtualization aspect though. So this time we will do a local virtualization of my 2016 server. So local virtualization, same thing on the right side, choose a recovery point. I'll choose my latest. Start restore. 
So it brings you into a page where it gives you the ability to manipulate, you know, the resources and how you want to connect to it and the networking like options. So starting up, up here in the upper left, you can see the available resources. So these are the resources that are available on my Datto appliance currently in terms of RAM and CPU. Um, you're going to notice that the RAM right here is going to drop down a little bit because I just dedicated four gigs of RAM, you know, down here. So that's where you come down here. You have the CPU core. So how much CPU you want to dedicate. Uh, RAM, so four gigs, you can start, start to pull out of that little queue there. Uh, some networking options. So how you want to be, you know, what, what sort of availability you want from this VM on your network. Um, I'm going to do disconnected, you know, that's for now, for this, for all intents and purposes, you know, for this demonstration, but you might do this if you just want to say, you know, spin it up, make sure files and folders are, you know, are uh, available, you know, it's bootable, uh, but you don't want to have any sort of like, you know, uh, any sort of uh, you know corruption or anything like that, like on your network in terms of like you know IPs, you know conflicting or anything of that nature. You just kind of want to spin it up, make sure everything's as is, but not do a whole lot of network interaction. Firewall in a private subnet. So this is like more of like your sandboxing type of solution. So you know a good example might be like, hey, like you know I got a security patch, you know to my OS, or I got like an update to a specific application. Let's apply it, you know, to this virtual machine first and then see like, you know, like how it interacts with everything else, you know, within this particular system before I release it, you know, to public on the production machine. Uh, but more often than not, you probably do bridge, bridge to the primary NIC. Um, so this is where you're essentially, you know, like you're spinning it up, you're kind of using the data appliance more as like a placeholder from a business continuity perspective. So people still connect to it the same way, like they, they always would, uh, as if it was like a file server or a specific database, and still have all that accessibility that you normally would have from that production machine. Click apply to make any changes, a stick, and you see a little summary over here. And then uh, it lets you know uh, through this little screenshot here, you know, when you're, you know, what's going on in the background in terms of that spin up. So I'm going to connect to it just for via uh, VNC. So I click right on here. That opens up a new tab. And then that will bring me that particular VM. And I can access this from here. So I'll go through the same control delete mechanism. Let's see if I can uh, remember my password for this guy here. And then once you throw in your credentials and authenticate, boom, you're on the desktop. Business as usual, same as it ever was. And the beauty about, you know, these virtual instances is that, you know, while, you know, users are working here and you or whomever else is working on the production machine to get it up to snuff, those uh, backups, those scheduled backups will continue to take place as if this was the production machine. So that's really a key point, right? So not only are you standing it up for business continuity sake, um, you're also going to re capture all those changes that might occur from like a proprietary data perspective so that when you're ready to go back to production, all those changes will have been captured and you can go back through those methods that I kind of quickly outlined previously in terms of, um, you know, do I want to do just a granular file level restore? Do I want to do uh, any sort of like just a bare metal restore? Do I just want to bring it back to my hypervisor? All the latest and greatest changes will be there. And obviously you still also have the ability to perform uh, virtualizations in our cloud. So let's say you're in a disaster recovery scenario. Uh, local production machines and data appliances have all become compromised. Uh, you just make a quick call, you know, to the help desk and, you know, we can spin up a virtualization, you know, uh, you know, whatever backup or recovery point your desire in our cloud, you know, a few different methods of how you would connect to that virtualization. Uh, it's either going to be via public IP addresses, uh, VNC, or VPN, you know, we try and leverage open VPN, you know, as much as possible, because it just gives more flexibility, uh, but we can do site to site and uh, IPsec as well, if that's what your desire would be. So that is it from the virtualization, you know, component perspective. So I'm actually gonna hand it back to Mike. Uh, Mike, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted me to show. No, I think this was great. And you know, I think we're going to roll into Q and A anyway. If any specific questions for Chris or myself, we could handle that. But I think uh, I'm turning it back over to Mike, right, to to open it up to some more discussion. Yes, thanks, uh, thanks, Chris. Thanks, uh, Mike. Fantastic information there. Uh, I think the real key that everybody wants to understand there is, uh, you know, protecting your data, whether it's in the cloud or local. Uh, is critical, but also, you know, not just from a backup standpoint, but from the, the ability to get it back quickly. Um, those downtime numbers were, uh, were a little bit alarming uh, as far as the, the cost of the downtime as they compare to uh, just the cost of the ransomware and certainly against the cost of uh, the proactive versus reactive uh, 
nature of cybersecurity. I like to say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I didn't write that, but uh, I did uh, steal it to use it. Um, so uh, that's great. Questions can keep coming in, and we're going to hand back over to Bob, uh, who is going to talk a little bit about lessons learned from all of these uh, presentations today. Uh, then we'll continue to take some questions, and uh, and we'll be closing out shortly after that. Sounds good, Mike. Thanks very much. Um, as he said, uh, we're going to do a little recap of exactly where we started and how we got here today. Uh, from the lessons learned standpoint, we've got, um, I, I want to cover a little bit about the cybersecurity framework, mostly from um, an implementation standpoint. We use it. It's a standard. We, you know, there's plenty of compliances out there that you can choose, but this seems to be the framework that is the most widely known, widely accepted, um, and is a standard that everybody can use in place. It helps you establish a program. Um, it gets everybody on the same page, both people, technology, and the processes associated with using that technology and how those people operate every day. I think that's, that's really key. And not just how they operate, but how they get protected. Um, and that whole identification mechanism of figuring out exactly what you have that needs protecting. Um, again, I, I said this at the beginning when we first started today, it's not just about hardware uh, and software, it's about all the components of how data is ingested into your systems, how it gets moved throughout the systems in conjunction with your staff, and how you utilize that data in conjunction with your vendors and your customers, how you interact with them, how you move that data back and forth. I think those are really key things to understand about identifying what you have in the world that needs protecting. So talking about both from a protection and detection standpoint, uh, I know I said this when I first uh, started my presentation earlier this morning, um, uh, Mike just uh, reiterated it. They are looking, hackers are, for easy targets. They're doing broadcast phishing email attacks that they're going to hit thousands, even millions of email addresses. And they're just looking for somebody that's very busy. Uh, as Mike just said, late in the day on Fridays, they're doing it for a couple of reasons. It is um, probably your easier target at that time of day and at that time of the week, I agree. Um, a lot of this has to do with waiting time between an attack and the reaction. And if you don't have some sort of monitoring in place, if you're not using what we all, I think everybody that did a presentation today talked about defense in depth and making sure that we had multiple layers, that we were not only putting tools on the endpoints, but we were live monitoring them, making sure that we were looking for anomalies, but I think it's really important to understand how people think, you know, how these cyber warriors are out there looking for opportunities. Well, if they do something and, and at the end of the day, get you to do something for them, oh, I, uh, I got a new wire transfer set of instructions and I did that at three o'clock on a Friday. Well, Maybe somebody doesn't realize until Monday what exactly happened, but that the money went to the wrong place. But you can call your bank all you want. You're, you're past 48 hours. You're past 48 hours. It's 99% guarantee you're not getting the money back. That's the window of time you have and that the banks have and that the FBI can help and react and try to reverse that. But the way that, that the transactions are happening right now with respect to how they're moving money. They're not just hopping it over to Russia or North Korea or China. They're, ma they're making it much more subdued. They're hopping it even in between accounts within the same bank and then to another stateside bank and then offshore. Because of all of those hops, it doesn't necessarily look as conspicuous that something's wrong, but once it hops off offshore, it's probably done at that moment. You're not going to get the money, whether it's you or your vendor that you were trying to pay. Nobody's going to see that money 
Um, it's not, it's just not possible as far as reversing. So having this defense in depth and monitoring real time in place is really an important key. Um, these are probably very logical and, and obvious, but change passwords regularly. Now, regularly doesn't mean every 30 days. So you don't have to get crazy, but when you link it with long and unique passwords and you're not sitting them, you know, putting them on a sticky note on the side of your monitor or underside your, your keyboard, you've got to be able to have some hygiene that is going to make it very difficult for somebody to crack. And I know we we talked around the idea of the dark web, but never use company credentials and other accounts. The idea behind that is if that other uh, facility that, you know, let's say Staples, for instance, gets breached, all of a sudden, all the logins inside Staples systems are compromised or for sale on the dark web. Somebody pays a thousand dollars, a thousand of them, they probably get for a dollar and they broadcast out messages trying to use those credentials to be able to hack. Well, if you didn't use your company email as the path over on the Staples site, you're at much less risk. And train all your staff to do the same exact thing. And as everybody has said on this call, uh, you got to use multi-factor authentication where, and that, that I know people immediately think of either 365 or Google suite and also logins to the network, other SaaS applications that you use, you're hooked into Salesforce. Salesforce is a tool that makes multi-factor available. You have to enable it. It's not automatic, but it is out there and available. And then you, you've got to have detection mechanisms in place. You've got to be watching or having somebody watch activity constantly with advanced threat detection tools. You have to be really conscious about what you're looking at email-wise, hover over before you click and make sure that the spelling is correct on the domain that it's going to take you to. If it's not correct or it looks suspicious where uh, it looks like it might be an I, but it could be a lowercase l, that's a, that's a common tactic that they use in order to make something look like a legitimate web address. Monitor the dark web. And looking at it at a point in time once a year is not monitoring. That's, that's not going to find credentials for sale that trail back to your domain in a fashion that will help you. It needs to be real time and you have to be able to react as soon as you find something or your managed provider sends you a notice and say, hey, we just saw your credentials are for sale. You have to change every place you use that, um, that email address as your login. Those creds have to be changed immediately. Those are just, I know they sound like common sense, but they really are important hygiene methods. And then you move on to respond and recover. A lot of the stuff that Mike and Chris talked about. Um, you have to do everything in your power not to pay the ransom. The obvious reason, you know, is you don't want to lose money. You don't want money being lifted out of your control. But just as importantly, we don't want to fuel the cyber warfare that's going on out there. And every penny that goes to them is another reason for them to keep doing what they're doing. Um, you know, Chris just showed us a, an example of exactly how the data self-tests every single backup or every single day. You can choose exactly how you'd like that set up. But testing those backups to make sure that they are actually working, not just you're getting alerts to say, oh yeah, well, it partially successful or uh, missed these files. You need to know whether that backup is going to be bootable and it's gonna be functional when you need it. Because when you need it is not the time to find out, oh my goodness, and I think Mike mentioned this, oh, backups haven't been working for the last three months. We, we've, we get introduced to more potential customers specifically for that reason. We got a very big client down in New York City. They went to go recover from a ransomware attack six months since their backup had worked. Fired the managed provider and hired us the next day. Um, put in a data backup solution and it gets tested every single day. We even run full blown uh, disaster recovery scenarios once a year where we boot every single system at their place, that every server that they have and make sure they're accessible. It's just part of uh, a good process and, and a way to know that you're gonna be able to recover. 
when you need to. Um, both incident response and discovery, uh, disaster recovery plans, you have to have those in writing. It's not one of these, well, I kind of know what to do when something uh, goes awry. It has to be in writing, responsibilities assigned to specific individuals. Who are you going to call? What's your expectation for uh, recovery time? You know, Mike did a great job of explaining recovery point and recovery time, the difference between them, and exactly how you can determine how far back you're going to have to go in order to recover that recovery point. What are you going to lose? How often are you backing up? And then how long is it going to take for you to bring the stuff online and make people uh, whole and productive again? And there, there is a known um, term out there in the world, once breached, always breached. And, um, and I think a couple of folks have, have kind of skirted around and talked about that uh, a little bit on today's call. The, the theory is that if someone gets in your network, do you really ever know, number one, that your systems are clean and that you know that they're not still in there laying dormant? and somebody's gotten into the system, unless all the systems are wiped clean, completely replaced, reloaded from scratch, do you really know for a fact that they're not still in there, number one? And number two, somebody's gotten into your system, they found a path in, will they find that same path or a similar path to get into the system again in the future? They, they now see you as a viable target. I think that's really important for, um, for someone to understand. You know, some of the stuff that we learned from the guys at ConnectWise, we, uh, you know, we, it was a great demonstration of how a breach occurs and how it proliferates. Um, you know, and it, it doesn't have to be this grand scheme of uh, infecting every single machine. If somebody can get a foothold and get into a system, they can basically take control, they can watch, they can collect information. And because they're in there, we need to be monitoring, we need to be you know, log retention. We make a very, very big deal out of this, mostly because you can't count on local hardware doing a great job of collecting and quote unquote, long-term storing logs. Um, business email compromise, I mean, it almost speaks for itself with the whole Microsoft 365 and the, just, you know, for, for people that don't really think about this or access the tool every single day this way, picture being anywhere in the world, opening up a browser, typing in office.com and putting in your email address and someone knowing your password or maybe your password sequence. They can be anywhere in the world if you don't have the correct security enabled and log in and look like you, even though you're in Outlook working just as you expected and all of a sudden there's messages being read by someone else but you can't even tell it's happening. There's, they're basically sitting on the sidelines with a, a view right into your email account, watching activity. Now, do they have to be in the account? No. Well, once they got in there once, they can set up a forwarding rule and they send all the messages as they're coming in directly over to another, it could be Gmail account. <coughs> Excuse me. I think that's, that's how they operate every day. So if you picture how that happens, now they've got information on you. Now they can start deleting messages before you can even see them, but they get copies of them. And they're now acting on your behalf. I think that's a really, really critical thing to understand how the whole business email compromise can work and how they use it to their advantage. Obviously, the, you know, the antivirus world has changed and changed dramatically. And um, these constantly evolving threats and methods that they're using aren't, you know, they're, they're not legacy type viruses. They're not being launched to, you know, infect a machine. They're trying to get control. They're trying to get a foothold. I think that's a really, really important distinction to understand. And 
infecting the machine is really in today's world, trying to get control and watch what's going on in order to get information. And uh, this is, uh, you know, there are people out there that will say, uh, what should I do if something looks suspicious? And we agree, it probably is, you know, not always, but it probably is. You've got to stop. You've got to talk to your IT support team and, and start, they will start reacting immediately. And that's the key is immediacy of the reaction. You know, some people will reach over and yank the power cord out of the wall. There are good and bad things to that, okay? It probably stops something, but it also may wipe some of the information that we would use for forensics. Pull the network cable out of the wall. Well, that sounds like a great thing because it can't infect another machine, except nobody can help you because now no one can see the machine. Um, can't react, can't see what's going on. Uh, and you know, we talked about Sentinel-1 earlier. Dustin went through the scenario again. The Sentinel-1 console is still one of the things that's accessible and maybe the only thing once a machine is quarantined. So there are still advantages to having, having the access that we need. And then I think the, the, you know, the, where the rubber meets the road on all of this is, okay, something's happened, something bad. How are we going to be able to recover, recover quickly and hopefully avoid, which is the key to this whole thing, paying a ransom. You've been hit with ransomware, however it's been triggered, you've gotten the splash notification on your screen that says, hey, uh, you've got 72 hours to pay for us to tie it. You know, there's a countdown clock on your machine. Uh, we want this amount of Bitcoin and we'll, you'll see uh, instructions on how to pay us. Well, the way is not to pay them. You wanna be able to immediately get it back up and running. You know, both Mike and, and Chris explained exactly how that works with data technology. Immediately virtualize the machine, turn it back on, on the data appliance, and it looks like the production server is running, even though the production unit's down, this has taken its place. That is a, um, a perfect scenario for getting your team back up and running and giving you time to exhale and think about exactly how you're going to execute the eventual restore. And one of the comments was, okay, maybe the machine needs to be replaced. Okay, server needs to be replaced. Maybe a particular virtual machine has been corrupted. Okay, it gets powered down, build a new one. You can build it from a template. Maybe you don't even have to go that far. Just start restoring it from the data appliance as an export. And when you're ready to cut over, Bang, shut down the one that's working on the data, make the last you know, five, 10, 15 minutes worth of copies of the changes that just occurred and fire up the new image that's sitting on your VMware or Hyper-V environment. That's a, that's a long cry from 20 some odd days of downtime to literally minutes. That's a, that's a huge thing. And you've avoided paying the ransom. And one of the other things that hopefully you've avoided is them getting access to your data. So if you've quarantined the machine, if you've gotten them out of your system, if you've had monitoring and been able to recover the system, maybe your data is not out there for sale on the dark web. And that's another concern that's basically risen over the last probably two to three years that not only do they want your money, they want your data so that they can use it as a mechanism to sell. Um, and you know, a comprehensive uh, business continuity and disaster recovery program, it, it, it can reduce downtime. We've, we've seen it where somebody calls and says, we, we've got an incident, regardless of what it is, single servers can be back up in minutes. You know, it's not crazy to say from the time you decide that we're gonna bring it up on the data until it's up and operational, 15 minutes, that's not crazy. Um, yeah, okay, if you've got to connect to the data center and restore it up in Pennsylvania, uh, turn it on up there or Utah, it's a little bit more involved as Chris explained, you can connect via VNC, you can go uh, VPN, whether it's site to site or open VPN client, uh, but it's all, um, it's all a matter of trying to reduce downtime 
and have less impact on the organization. That's what we're really trying to, to save. You know, we're trying to eliminate that possibility that a business is going to go out of business because they were down for so long. You know, there, there's, a, there's a well-known article of a small medical practice out in Michigan where they got hit with ransomware. They went to backup. Backups were no good. They couldn't afford to pay the ransom. They decided to muddle through and do without it. And after three and a half weeks of living without knowing who was going to walk in the office next for an appointment because their appointment scheduler was gone, they basically shut the doors and said, we, we can't do this anymore. We have no idea who's coming. We don't have access to the medical records because those were on the server and we've lost all of our current history. Those are the things that you're trying to avoid and make sure that you've got a real, not just backup in place, but a business continuity solution that's ready to be used at the ready. Um, I think Mike's gonna talk uh, for a couple of minutes about uh, a cybersecurity framework assessment and how, uh, how this could be helpful to folks that are on the call with us. Great, thanks, Bob. Great recap of uh, everything we've seen in this uh, in this uh, presentation this morning. Um, we do have a special offer up here on the screen for uh, any attendees. If you would like us to do um, a compact uh, NIST cybersecurity framework assessment for your organization, we'll do that at no cost. Um, and the link to that has been put into the uh, into the chat for anybody who wants that. Uh, as we were talking through, while I don't have a slide for these, a couple additional things that um, we'd be willing to do if anybody would like a dark web scan of their organization um, to see if any of their uh, credentials are for sale on the dark web, we will do that for you at no cost. You can just uh, note in the chat that you'd like a dark web scan and we will, uh, we will follow up with you on that. Additionally, um, we can actually help you uh, calculate the cost of um, your current backup solution, as opposed to the kind of uh, business continuity solution that, that Mike DePama talked about today. Um, and if you're interested in that, please feel free to uh, throw something in the chat for us that says you'd like, uh, you'd like to understand um, what your backups uh, are costing you today in comparison to where they would be. Um, I was a little remiss after the data presentation that I did not uh, ask a question of the group and give you another chance for participation. So um, quick question to everyone. Um, and Brandon, if you can throw this in the chat as well. Uh, how um, do you feel that your current backup solution would you allow you to be back up and running as quickly as the type of solution that you saw here today to keep your business operational in the event of, a, uh, of any kind of downtime or a ransomware attack specifically? And uh, you can just answer yes or no. Um, in the chat, and those will be uh, those will be tallied as participation points. So all of those offers are available to everyone here today. Um, additionally, uh, we uh, we promised you lunch, and so uh, congratulations, you made it to the end. For everybody who made it through the presentations uh, here today and hung in with us to grab all this valuable information from these great experts, uh, we will be sending out uh, twenty-five dollar uh, um, gift cards. Uh, to uh, to so you can get yourself lunch. Um, I believe we're using DoorDash for those. So uh, you can you should watch those in the email that you signed up for the uh, presentation, uh, and those will show up uh, today. Uh, we're going to be tallying all the participation points and doing drawings for uh, prizes, which can include swag and gift cards and different kinds of things that we have here as thank yous for joining us today and participating in our event. Um, I wanted a special thank you to Bob, Dustin, uh, Mike, Chris, and Brandon for all the great content that you offered here today. Um, uh, hopefully everybody found this as valuable and interesting as I did, uh, the, the, the ways that folks can get in and wreak havoc on your organizations are numerous. And uh, we, we talked about a few of the most common here today. Hopefully just that knowledge will help you understand the things to look out for, um, help create a security first, uh, type environment in your, uh, in your own organization. Um, and with that, if we have any other questions, I would be happy to answer those for you. Um, if you wanna reach out other than the chat for any of the special offers or any other questions that you have, 
please feel free to submit those to marketing at kybersecure.com and Brandon will throw that in the chat as well. Um, thank you again to everybody who participated, uh, watching, presenting, et cetera. Uh, and with that, I bring to a close uh, Crack the Hack 2022. So uh, be cyber secure, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks, buddy.